I'd like to call the special city council meeting of October 14th to order. Lacey, would you please call the roll? Zengi? Here. Gage? Here. Bradbury? Here. Kiefer? Here. Flora? Here. Gas? Here. Bergeron? Thank you. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The Ketchikan City Council would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first people of this land in Ketchikan, the Tongass Clinket people. Under communications, we do have a proclamation, official proclamation, whereas alcohol and drug abuse affect individuals, families, and communities across the nation and in our community. And whereas it's imperative that visible, unified effort by community members be launched to prevent drug abuse. And whereas Red Ribbon Week offers citizens the opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to drug-free lifestyle, no use of illegal drugs, and no illegal use of legal drugs. And whereas Red Ribbon Week will be celebrated in community across nations on October 23rd through the 31st, and whereas the community of Ketchikan, Alaska further commits its resources to ensure the success and the spirit of Red Ribbon Week campaign by wearing and displaying red ribbon during the week-long campaign. Now, therefore, be resolved by I, Robert Severson, Mayor of the City of Ketchikan, to hereby proclaim October 23rd through the 31st as Red Ribbon Week and encourage you to participate in drug prevention and education activities, not only during Red Women Week, but also through the year, making a visible statement that we are strongly committed to a drug-free lifestyle. Is there somebody here to receive this tonight? Hello, good evening. We are here from the Ketchikan Wellness Coalition and the Spirit Task Force to accept the proclamation. We also brought each of you a red ribbon that you can keep to wear for the Red Ribbon Week. So Deborah Asper is our new Drug Free Communities Coordinator. She will pass those along uh, with some information about the task force, and we thank you for the proclamation for Red Ribbon Week. And then also for you in the audience, if you would like a red ribbon to wear on that week, she does have some extras. <laughs> Thank, thank you for that. So um, we're going to enter into the rest of the order of business, which will be starting with person to be heard. But as this meeting was set up, uh, Vice Mayor Kiefer uh, would be mayor at this particular time, uh, but the certifications have been extended to the 18th. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Vice Mayor Kiefer. Thank you, Mayor Severson. Okay, welcome, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's nice to see a real good turnout of, uh, of folks, and hopefully, hopefully we can hear a lot of good information tonight. This is basically an information meeting for the council to find out you know, what's being done in the community, where things stand, what the individual groups and individuals who also want to speak as members of the public, uh, what they think should be happening, and basically what we can do, the city can do to support those efforts. So... Um, I've got a list here of some of the groups that are, we're going to speak tonight. How about if we start off with KIC? There were several folks from KIC who were going to come on up. And, and first of all, once again, tell us what your, your behavioral health group is doing, but also um, what you would like to see happen you know, 
in, in a perfect world? You know, what, what could happen better to improve things? Yes, please. Hello, my name is uh, Debbie Knurk, and I work for uh, KIC Behavioral Health as a substance abuse counselor. And is there anybody else want to introduce? Just say what I want. Um, yep. Yeah, a little, yeah. little close to the mic, Deb. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I just want to say that, you know, every day we see people that are struggling, and um, one of the one of the main issues that I see is that people that want to go to treatment, there is a huge barrier with waiting for an assessment, for instance, uh, or having to have gone through detox before going to inpatient treatment, and I think that's a huge barrier. Um, another thing is. A lot of the clients that we see have trouble with the law and they go to jail and there they sit while they wait, you know, for their trial and nothing seems, there's no program that specifically um, it is, involves substance abuse. And I think that that's a captive audience that could be, um, you know, they could be getting some information, whether they wanted it or not, you know, they're gonna sober up in jail. They're gonna maybe start thinking because every single person that I've ever known that has used, has been uh, addicted to a substance, they are not having fun, they're not partying, they are miserable, they're lost, and, um, I don't know. It's just really upsetting to see people that they want help, but yet the drug is impacting their brain. You know, it's a brain disease that it's not their fault they have it, but I don't know if anybody here, when they were in high school, tried something and then thought, oh no, I don't want to do that. Well, if you have a problem with addiction, you know, you might try it once or a couple times and you might not have that option. So, uh, and there's a huge stigma, and there's turn off the stigma. This is awesome. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna you stop. you said there was a problem with assessments, or a, a barrier to assessments. Where where is that barrier at? What is it? Is it with your organization? Is it with some other organization? Is it the state who's? It's where, just that it's like we we don't do like drop in, you know, like uh, assessments. Mm -hmm right now because of COVID. So the COVID right. is actually a barrier, yep. but we were doing that before, before COVID hit. Um, and can Ruth? Yes, so, please. Sorry. That's my first time I've ever spoken. So you, did good. you did fine. I'm Ruth Bullock. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health for KIC. Um, this is Clarence Peel. He works, he is now a state certified substance abuse counselor. This is Lance Ho. He's also a state certified substance abuse counselor. They both work in our program along with Deb Knirk. What Debbie said was correct. It, it, it is a barrier for somebody who needs to get to treatment to get an assessment. Um, we've been trying to do all kinds of creative things to, to limit that barrier and get people in quicker. <clears throat> the only other place that I'm aware of, I think some private practice people can do drug and alcohol assessments. The only other place in town that I'm aware of is Gateway, and I'll let them speak to what their, their current situation is. Um, getting, getting people into residential treatment is a huge barrier. Um, across the state, Medicaid will pay for, for the, full, the full cost of residential treatment but we have people here waiting and waiting and waiting and trying to stay sober and trying not to overdose for <clears throat> a couple months at a time probably before we can get a, a bed date. Um, 
So, so it's fair to say there's not enough there's capacity not. in the state. Okay. Yep. yep, that's a big issue. Um, additionally, as far as the overdoses, um, um, one of my work partners, Jesse Pilcher, uh, who works with us, I think about a year ago, Jesse and I saw our very first fentanyl in a, in a drug screen. Um, now it's pretty unusual for us not to see fentanyl in a drug screen. It's everywhere. Um, we get Narcan kits. This is Jesse Pilcher. <clears throat> we get Narcan kits from the state. I think I have about 70 of them in my office right now. We probably give out two or three every single day. Um, we should probably be giving out more than that. But the, the last batch of Narcan kits that we got came also with a fentanyl test kit um, for people to test their heroin to see if it has fentanyl in it. Not that they won't use it if it has fentanyl in it, they will. But it's at least they know that they're getting fentanyl. We're also seeing a lot of fentanyl coming in in meth and most people who are using meth aren't expecting to have fentanyl in, in it. Um, I think that, and, and there's certainly people here who know more about that than, than I do, but I think that the fentanyl is probably more the source of the overdoses at this point than the heroin. In fact, uh, we just had somebody tell us the other day, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's easier to get fentanyl at this point in town than it is to get heroin. And I don't, um, I think the police could, could uh, probably know a lot more about that than we do, but um, I think the there's probably a direct correlation between the fentanyl that is here and the overdoses. And I'll be quiet. Thank you very much for doing this. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Clarence Peel. I'm a recovering drug addict. I have seven years, two months, and a week or so. Um, I broke an island pharmacy August 6th of 2014. That's how deep I was in my drug addiction. So there is hope. And I believe um, working with KIC now was one of my best and my greatest accomplishments in my life. Right? Well, I'm oh, sorry, I'm married also, so that was one of my biggest. Uh, you, you can go home, that's good. You're, you. you're good. Yeah, you. <laughs> there is a lot of hope because of the people that are in the positions that they are in. I get to work with a ton of different people and learn from a ton of different people, and it is amazing. We offer at KIC men's and women's group on Mondays, which are open groups. Tuesday is an open group. Thursday is a closed group. And Friday is an open group. That is just for support for people that want to come in. KIC or IHS members. That's what we offer down there. And we try to do the best. And we try to get that out for everybody so that they know it's there and available. I think that's. Your Honor, if I may. A question. Yep. So, um, and congratulations on, on being clean at this the point in time. The marriage or the? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Both. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, leading up to that, how many times were you offered some kind of help or? Um, leading up to me getting in trouble? For breaking into this place? Yeah. I've been to jail 24 times. A lot of them were down in Oregon and seven of them are up here. I went to two treatments down in Oregon, but I was not ready to listen and I was not ready to learn. I knew everything. Up here, my second chance, sorry, I went to the car house for 10 days and did some stuff that actually got me booted from the place for threatening somebody. And the second time that I came, yeah, yeah, you're not supposed to threaten people. But the, the, <laughs> the best part was that they accepted me back because they knew that I was defeated by the drug. It wasn't that I was going to prison for 10 years because of the crime that I committed. It was that I was defeated by the drug and I was able to listen. That's what helped save my life. Knowing that there was people that actually cared gave me hope because I broke down in front of them crying. And then they said, okay, we'll accept you back. You just have separate rules now because of the first time that you came here. And that was at the car house in 2014, end of 2014. Thank you for yeah. that. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, <coughs> I've had uh, individuals in my family that have suffered with addiction and um, 
it's almost like they're not going to change one minute before they're ready because they, like you say, you already know everything, right? Um, and I've, I've witnessed that and thankfully some have. So again, I appreciate you sharing that story because I think it's an important fact of, of the um, recidivism that we see and stuff. Uh, you get somebody incarcerated and they come back out and they they're right, fall right back into the same path. But hopefully, as in your case, there's that one thing that trips the trigger or whatever it is and leads them down the path that they need to be on. So I appreciate your, your comments. Yes, thank you. Other questions for? Go ahead. Yeah, Clarence, uh, I'm just curious for this deal. Uh, being that you've gone through the whole process from the very start of your addiction to where you're at now, is there one or more things that you could say that uh, either really got in the way of you recovering or things that we or the city could improve on to, to help you, anything like that, looking back? Well, we create our own everything. A, a person individually creates their own how they want to deal with stuff. So in my position where I was going through, I just understood that I needed to learn all the time. And that was my favorite thing to do was ask people in front of me that were healthier than I was for help. That was the biggest thing that I did, I think, that helped save my whole life, was just being able to say, I need help. And those people were there to say something and be there at the time. Please. Uh, I just want to add, Clarence is also a graduate of Therapeutic Court, which was, in my opinion, a phenomenal program and no longer exists here. So um, you, you, you mentioned the KIC has a variety of support groups. What other specific programs do you guys have? Uh, we have, uh, there's a couple of grants that they're running, I believe, and they have uh, youth prevention programs that they're starting up. There's, um, uh, yeah, that's just our department, uh, Behavioral Health Side. And there's, um, there's medically assisted treatment, the MAP program that they do with the Suboxone. There's social services, they have a ton of stuff that they are trying to start up and work. There's the education department that is trying to do a re-envision is what it's called and that's helping people when they're getting out of jail into places, find jobs, resumes, work clothes. There's a lot of stuff that they're trying to offer now. Okay. Any other questions for KIC? Thank you guys very, very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot, hey, I forgot so, about Lance. Uh, I just want to say uh, something that uh, I've got like six years of clean and sober time, and I had 30 years almost of out of addiction, in and out of prison, um, almost 13 years in prison, uh, and the whole time I never got treatment once. I got it one time offered up here, and uh, I took it. And uh, it was the best thing for me because it changed my life, you know. I've, I've been a drug dealer for a long time, for 27 years. I've been no good drug dealer, you know. I was good at it, but I just, you know. But uh, <laughs> that wasn't a life, you know. Um, and what saved me was the treatment as well as aftercare and the trans housing. You gotta have services afterwards. You gotta, you gotta have that. It's mandatory, or they're gonna fail. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone from the hospital here? Dr. Jose, I think was supposed to be here. I'm not, oh, there you are. Come on down, sir. Uh, Dory couldn't be here today, so she did want me to pass along some information 
just about some medical alcohol de detox at the hospital. Um, but primarily, I'm here representing myself. I work in the hospital as a hospitalist, so I am often discharging several patients in the recovery community or who are actively using. And I'm also receiving them in the clinic as a clinic provider. So I'm, I'm getting uh, two views of this issue. One, well, a third being a member of the community. Um, and I wanted to highlight a few things. Um, I think the main points here are the counseling, the housing, um, the discharge issues that we have, leaving the hospital, and also just thinking upstream about this entire issue to begin with. Um, and I think the discussion, uh, from what I have heard, is focusing on alcohol and opiates, so I will focus on that myself. I have noticed as a clinic provider that it can be very hard to get someone to counseling, uh, particularly for our Medicaid population who sometimes need counseling the most. Uh, if you look at our Medicaid options in town, there's usually only like three or four providers, if that. Um, otherwise, you will have to pay out of pocket, and that sum could be up to a few hundred dollars per session. And uh, oftentimes, when we're dealing with these types of things, it's not just one session that can get a patient through a critical psychiatric crisis. So I think the counseling services in town are quite limited. Um, I, you heard that sometimes it could take multiple offers of you know, services until someone is able or, or willing to uh, take that on. And so I think the issue right now as a provider is that I, I don't even have things to offer people because it's not available to them. So it can be hard to not have something there, let alone have to offer that thing multiple times. Uh, so that could be frustrating. Um, I think this has been mentioned by other people as well, but the drug use and alcohol use in town is intrinsically tied in with the housing situation. I have heard from several people that we have discharged from the hospital end up going to the homeless shelter or some type of inpatient program that uh, you know they don't have any other options to fall back to. They're ending up needing to go to the homeless shelter. And oftentimes, the people who are in these shelters are also struggling with drug and alcohol use issues. So just imagine recently quitting smoking, you walk by someone who lit up a cigarette, you're gonna have those triggers. And I, I think it could be difficult for people to get out of this situation uh, if they are getting put back in uh, you know, very negative stimuli that can cause them to relapse. Uh, so housing is an issue that has been difficult for both outpatient and even leaving the hospital. Um, discharge issues, so, um, Detox for alcohol has been brought up here, and that's one thing that uh, Dory wanted me to highlight today. We had plans to uh, work with Gateway and KIC to have a medical detox program where you know, we can work with these organizations, they come to the hospital, we medically detox them, and then they can get discharged to uh, whatever treatment program they have. Currently, the, the best option that we have is to send someone to Anchorage, and so we're trying to fill that hole here in the community by keeping them on island to medically detox, and then they can go into some type of inpatient treatment program locally, which can be pretty helpful for some folks, especially some who um, have a lot of family here as their savior system in their life. So I think that is gonna be a huge thing moving forward. Um, I'm not a part of administration, so I can't really give you guys specifics about this, but the idea is we would actually like to start this uh, pretty soon. It was kind of held back due to COVID and our recent COVID surge, um, and the idea is to uh, have this program on a trial basis, so we would start with a few patients, see how it goes, and reevaluate the process moving forward. Again, I don't really know the specifics of this, but we have had trainings within our facility to get this going. Uh, so I think uh, getting this off the ground would largely depend on uh, COVID needs in the hospital itself. Um, let's see. So inpatient rehab options and slots in town are pretty limited. Uh, a lot of people, I just had a patient who had to go up north uh, and leave their family for several months for treatment. Um, and then, so I, I guess one thing I would put forward when we're having this discussion is you know, really reframing this uh, and thinking upstream because uh, for me as a clinician, most often when I am seeing drug and alcohol use issues, it is a manifestation of some type of trauma, which people can sustain in adulthood as well as childhood and adolescence. So I think it would be really good for us to focus on the youth and uh, thinking upstream about how we can prevent uh, folks from ending up in this position to begin with. Uh, so I think that's a huge part of this, this um, 
this, this endeavor. Um, and the last thing is, you know, we've had some people talk here uh, <laughs> who are members of the recovery community, and it would be really great to get more input from those who are actually going through this themselves. Is there anything specifically that the city at this point could do to help you guys move along on, on your proposed detox For the operation? De the detox program, well, I, I think as a community we need to get a handle on COVID, which it seems like is on its way, but um, ultimately it will just kind of depend on the staffing needs within the hospital itself. I think that's one of the major drawbacks um, when we sometimes are struggling with um, staff at baseline. So, Mayor, if I may. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, I, I know that a lot of times we use uh, the phrase, what can the city do? But this is really a community issue. We have three separate governments on the, on the island, and all of them are impacted by, by this. And the community is impacted because uh, when you start thinking about insurance costs, health care costs, all that kind of stuff, it's elevated by uh, the times when the hospital provides services at no payment. That has to be made up someplace. Um, and as you talk about the detox, um, it would be interesting to see if the state of Alaska or federal government have any money in the ARPA programs to fund the training and maybe the placement for at least the first year or term um, to help support that. Because I think it's very important that um, those that we can keep in town, we do. I think the support that they will get from their family it will have uh, a huge effect on the outcome of their of their program. Yeah, no, thank you for that note. And I, I guess one thing I want to highlight too is I'm just grateful that you guys are having this conversation to begin with. Uh, and one thing the city could do is uh, continue to work towards destigmatizing alcohol and drug use just because um, it could be very hard for someone to come forward to ask for help if we already look at them in a low light. Thank you. Generally? Yeah, I have one question for you. Um, have you, I, I know you mentioned Gateway, but have you, do you know, well, I guess this is a question to bring back to Dory is, has she talked to the other agencies, KIC, um, and um, I don't even, probably shouldn't throw community connections in there, but why not? So KIC and Gateway are the two primary uh, right. organizations that we would be working with. Okay. So you guys are working with guys. Okay. Other questions for Dr. Rose? Thank you very much. Let's hear from the Wellness Coalition. Uh, Romanda Simpson, uh, Executive Director of Ketchikan Wellness Coalition. Um, thank you for having us. We do have a task force called PEERS, which stands for Prevention, Intervention, Education, Recovery, and Support. And this is a group um, that is funded by a state grant for the drug-free communities. Um, Deborah Asper is our new coordinator of that program. Uh, we basically do the same thing that's happening here tonight. We convene people that are uh, excited and passionate about reducing the use of alcohol and any other drugs. Um, the group primarily focuses on prevention, so we do a lot of education and outreach. Um, our goal is to prevent use in teens, but as part of that, we actually focus on educating parents and getting the community involved. Um, the perception of alcohol use, for example, is very uh, casual, and everyone uses it all the time, so how do we change that within the, the youth? Um, and then also in informing our community about reducing access to alcohol in particular. Um, there is also, mentioning to the research, we just did our community health needs assessment uh, last year, and detox center was one of the top issues that was brought up by multiple um, agencies and individuals through all, all components. We did focus groups, we did community survey, and we also did 
one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews. So that was definitely a top need, and I'm, I am excited to hear that it is still moving forward um, for the detox. That does come up regularly. Um, we also really work on partnering with organizations to try to enhance their capacity to respond um, to different issues. And what uh, the group decided to bring forth as requests or encouragement or suggestions to the city on how you guys can respond or partner with us um, include the following. Um, because we focus a lot on education, they suggested that we um, are able to work with you on creating a destigmatizing campaign. So a lot of it is on, on Facebook, you see some really negative um, comments that come in. So how can we uh, tackle that as, as a team to reduce the stigma and encourage people to seek treatment? Um, so working with us on PSAs or outreach and education, Facebook groups, uh, uh, outreach. Also allowing us to use the infrastructure for other, either programs or resources. One example that was really simple and easy fill is that if we do create uh, like, a, like a billboard or a sign, being able to put it onto the city, um, city properties um, would be a really simple ask and, and a great partnership. Um, obviously either other additional programs if we're finding lack of location in our community, there's potential for um, city properties to be used for alternative programs as well. Uh, Narcan, it was mentioned, um, is a really good option. And I know that some of you guys were trained, which is great. Um, it was suggested that every single city staff member is trained in Narcan and that uh, kits are available at all staff locations, including things like hole in the wall. Um, and so having them available throughout the city um, and then actually Kim Simpson and Morgan Weber at KPU came and said, how about we have a sticker? Um, so we're looking to create a sticker that would show this business has Narcan on site. So similar to an AED where you know where it is. So we're able to provide that little sticker, um, but having the city on board saying, we're following that, that would go a long way with other businesses then stepping forward and saying, we're doing that too. Um, we are working on getting as many businesses in town um, having Narcan on site. Another thing that was mentioned was safe disposal containers. Um, I know that's a heated uh, discussion oftentimes, uh, but that's just one way to show that the city understands that there is use in our community and how do we um, not ignore it and, and provide for uh, a safe disposal of, of needles. Um, I think that's all I have for my comments tonight that was ideas, but we're definitely willing to continue to come to the conversations like this. Um, there was a comment made about it's great that we're having this conversation, but we need to also take action. So I'm really, really hoping to see some like forward, like let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, um, coming from tonight. Any questions for me? Any questions? If I may. <clears throat> So you do say that you're doing some prevention stuff with adults and teens. How are you reaching out to them? How are you communicating? And what is, I mean, how, what is the numbers that, you, that you're dealing with? It? Yeah, that's great. Um, so right now, the most recent thing that we've done is the youth space at the Plaza Mall. Um, so part of it was through CARES funds, and then now it's actually being maintained with some grant money from the city, so thank you for that. Uh, we just issued a little post-it card to every single high school student um, in, in Ketchikan. So any student that is at Revilla or K-High received this card. And since then, actually, our, our attendance has come. More kids are coming and hanging out. For parents, depending on what it is that we're doing, um, we often, pre-COVID, we <laughs> did all of the parent-teacher conferences. And then pre-COVID, we were also in the schools at lunchtime doing tables and doing kind of fun engagement. Um, coming up with Red Ribbon Week, we're doing uh, door decorating competitions that we're supporting. We are encouraging a, we're gonna have a coloring contest. Um, and then for parents, we are also planning to do a hidden in plain sight uh, bedroom. So it's a mock bedroom of, of a youth and in partnership with our police department, we'll be able to walk a parent through and they can identify signs and, um, that might indicate some sort of substance use. Um, and so that's gonna be advertised. Facebook is a really popular mode of communication in our community, so we often 
use Facebook as our primary mode, um, or we also work with our schools to send out messages to the parents to let them know what's going on. We do mental health first aid training, and for parents, we reach them through the schools as well. Thank you. I, you know, I, I, I appreciate all that, but you know, like handing out flyers to students, how many of those actually make it home? I yep. mean, I, I, I mean, I've seen that with my kids and with my grandkids. There's things, if you ask them what's going on in school, oh, nothing, you know, and, and very seldom will they bring those pamphlets or so. Um, I guess I'm looking for a little bit more interaction, and I hear a lot of people talking about COVID. COVID's around for a while, guys, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. So, um, you know, whether it be Zoom-type meetings, maybe a, a facility that has the ability to social distance and actually communicate with individuals, um, I think that, uh, you know, COVID has definitely had an impact but we have to figure out how to deal with that and still go on with the rest of our lives and do the things that we need to do. And as you mentioned, we've been having these discussions. I have a, a paper in front of me here that was a report in 2016 where we did just what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we didn't get a lot of action items out of that. We had some planning, and of course, then COVID hit, right? So it, it changed a lot about how that was implemented. But uh, we we got to work at find that tool that makes the difference. We can discuss this. We can we can put flyers out. We can do all that kind of stuff. But we have to be able to gauge the impact of that. And if it's not working, we have to change what we're doing. So this is exactly where my first point about partnering with you as a city, um, especially since COVID. I feel like a lot of people follow the city. Uh, for news and information in particular now. Um, so if we do have education or materials or events or opportunities for education, that's where we could come to you and say, can you please promote this? Um, and then working with you guys on, on putting it on your Facebook, because like I said, the, there's a lot of people on Facebook. Yep, thank you. Thank you. I was gonna ask any other questions for Wallace Commissioner? Oh, sorry. Well, not so much a question, but uh, you kind of hit on a point, I guess it'd be more of a statement, but, you know, talking with a lot of people before this meeting, people were really excited, and like you said, Mr. Mayor, that, you know, everybody wants to address the problem, but kind of everybody's saying, what can we do? What can each organization do? But uh, as far as I think that's one step that everybody personally can take, it, like you mentioned with the... Facebook and putting up signs and city property or maybe your house and stuff. So I think if everybody just takes that little bit of reaching out to folks who may be struggling or things of that nature, just in your own personal life, that's definitely square one. So I just wanted to say that. And on those that. Facebook comments, when you see individuals slamming people that are facing addiction, taking that time to like call them out and say, that's not the type of response we want in this community. That's not who we are. We're Here's a, here's a support system that you can have. Here's the amazing resources that are out there. Um, and so us, each of us taking that initiative would be really great. Thank you. Okay. Um, is anyone from, from Aquila here tonight? Aquila, yeah. Oh, way back there, sorry. Hello, I'm Jim Harriman. I'm the Regional Clinical Director for Aquila Gateway Center for Human Services. I've been here for two years, so 
I'm relatively new to the community. I'm giving you two things, two items that I want to be able to address to answer some questions regarding what we are doing uh, as a community behavioral health program. And then I've brought with me also Estelle Cowie, who is one of our mental health clinicians and a certified substance use provider and was uh, in the past the program manager for Car House. So she'll have some information that may be better suited than what I can provide. The brochure you have gives you an overview of our services. I'm not going to regurgitate that. Uh, the information that you see there, I certainly will answer any questions that you might have regarding the services that we are able to provide as a community behavioral health uh, provider. And then the information binder gives you an overview of the services that we specifically provide for substance misuse disorder and lists the groups that we provide. And um, this is outpatient treatment. And then we also provide the level 3.5, which is the residential uh, treatment. So as far as the overview of the services and mentioned earlier assessments, one of the things that when I first came here that Akila had started doing was remote telehealth assessments. And the reason mainly for that, that uh, was a very beneficial uh, tool outside of COVID, pre-COVID, and then fortunately COVID, and it will continue post-COVID, there will be a post COVID, I believe, um, is individuals come in and they are immediately got, uh, they can immediately get into an assessment because there's more opportunity to offer those assessments because they're provided via telehealth remotely. The providers are from uh, other states, possibly Missouri, possibly Tennessee, possibly Iowa, who knows, all across the United States we have providers. And um, the wait list went from three months to about seven days. So that's significant as far as being able to get in to an assessment. Certainly, I think what most people would agree is as much interaction as we are having here locally, involving with the Wellness Coalition, involving with uh, the CAP meetings, and there's multiple opportunities for us as providers and organizations to participate in the community because of the community having the resources through the Wellness Coalition or Pierce or um, BHAG, the different groups that we are able to learn about one another and the services. But it comes down to the individual who steps out and decides to make an appointment for an assessment and then follow through with the recommendations of that assessment, whether it be outpatient or residential treatment. So as, as much as we do in every community, and I've, I've been in Alaska for seven years, Bethel, Barrel, Dillingham, areas that the substance misuse problem is magnified when you look at the number of individuals who are reaching out for services in Ketchikan, it always comes down to the individual that steps out and makes that decision. And I've heard several tonight who are in recovery talk about they were ready, when they were ready, when I got ready, when I was ready to learn. Each of us can identify with that in our own lives, regardless of whether we're talking about substance <coughs> misuse or eating too much or, you know, whatever the, the problem be that in our lives, when we're ready to tackle it, we'll tackle it. And hopefully get to recovery, whether it be mental health or substance use. And that's something that we're working more and more toward as an organization is helping individuals beat down that stigma and understand that mental health and substance use are together entwined 
in our lives, and one leads to the other, it's the chicken and the egg, uh, you know, they're affected by each other. So when you look at the numbers, and I, I know we've talked a lot about what we're doing, when you look at the numbers in a community the size of Ketchikan, they're relatively small numbers of individuals that we treat. We have an outpatient um, enrollment in mental health of about 75, and an outpatient enrollment in substance use of about 35. I think most people would think those numbers would be much larger, but that's because people aren't ready and when they're ready, they will come, you know, type idea. The groups that we offer right now in outpatient, our group numbers uh, fluctuate anywhere from, and we've got a number of groups that we're offering. Uh, we've been able to expand those offerings with the 1115 Medicaid waiver, uh, which has allowed for opportunities where there weren't opportunities before. It's changed Medicaid, but uh, many, much of it for the better, is um, more services with a restraint on the amount of time that you can then engage in those services. So the funding then cuts short, and as the 1115 waiver expands, we're going to learn a lot more about what uh, the reality of that will be. But our groups for outpatient run about 15 to 20, um, depending on the group and the level of care. And then with residential, we we are a 15-bed facility, but um, COVID has mandated, of course, that we have two rooms for isolation. So we're now an 11-bed facility, and we have open beds. Um, that uh, is for an, a various reasons. There are individuals who don't want to go to Car House because it's local and they know the other individuals that are in treatment and would rather have treatment uh, with individuals who they don't know. Fortunately, we have Aquila House in Anchorage that we can then refer directly to another facility. And in our Anchorage facility, Aquila House, we've just had a major expansion and are going to um, expanding our beds up to 40, I believe is our number of beds in Anchorage. So that's enabling us to be able to trans transition some of those individuals from here to Anchorage if um, the COVID restrictions allow for that. So um, as far as what we're providing here, and I'm not just saying this because I'm now here with Aquila Gateway, but from those other uh, regions in Alaska that I have uh, provided services as a director of behavioral health, we're doing great things in this community for offering services, for having the opportunity for services, and then if, if when, if and when people are ready, we certainly have the opportunities for them here in Ketchikan to, to get services. We, of course, have been limited because of COVID. All of our services are being provided via telehealth right now. We were open for a couple of months uh, across the entire past 16 months here and there, but this last surge mandated that we return to working from home. Um, and really are having surprisingly great numbers of individuals participating through telehealth or phone. November 1st, the state has said that that ends because of the emergency regulations. We'll see what happens um, at the end of October, which is nearing, because when that happens, those who are, are more likely not to come in to face-to-face -face services that can hurt uh, the treatment overall, whether that be mental, mental health or substance use or misuse. Um, I'm going to uh, give this over to Estelle, but before I do, is there any question, do you have any questions specifically for me about the services? Generally. Um, so with the Medicaid expansion, are they changing the rules to how many beds you can have now? 
when no. you said that they're expanding the Aquila House? Aquila House is expanding, and what you have to do is request that from the state, and then that's an expansion that you can, if you get approved for that, and we were approved for that. We were, our Aquila House in Anchorage was the, the first component of Aquila. In fact, they were the pilot program for the, for the 1115 waiver. Okay. Um, they started with the 1115 waiver in 2000. 17, 18, and uh, they started immediately. We here in uh, Ketchikan just started last year, so it's a shorter, it'll be over in two years. I believe it was a five-year program. Three-year, it was a three-year program for us. So that could open up more beds? If, if it. the 1115 waiver is, if the state decides to continue, it won't, for Ketchikan, opening up more beds will mean something totally different because of the funding uh, locally and the space locally. The other component that I didn't mention but is mentioned in the flyer is, and you've heard others speak about it, transitional housing, how important that, that component is for people to, for individuals to be able to continue recovery because you just, you know, you go home and you, you've got those that you love who are using. And um, it's difficult to say I can't be around you anymore because you use when I love you as a family member. You had a question, Judy? Sorry, Judy. Excuse me, can you uh, tell me, are you fully staffed right now? No, uh, fully staffed as far as clinicians, substance use or mental health, or both. Both. We are short a half of a clinician, <laughs> uh, which uh, just means that FTE is a half FTE. We have a program manager position that is about to be filled that will be half of a clinician, and then that will leave a half of a clinician need. Uh, we have all of our clinical associates filled, both substance use and um, mental health, and that's what used to be known as case managers. That's the term for 1115 waiver. And then um, we're staffing our residential program manager with a uh, staffing agency, and that's a temp, temp position that has been with us for six months, so that position is filled for another six months for sure. After that, you know, we haven't had any applicants for SUD, substance, substance use program manager, or outpatient program manager until, so it's been two years for outpatient program manager and about a year for residential program manager. So the positions are certainly difficult to fill in those positions that require or expect a higher degree. Um, our residential is fully staffed, so we're short half of a clinician. Other than that, at this point, we're fully staffed for what Aquila budgeting is allowing for us. Okay, I have one more. Go ahead. Um, and you operate, Aquila operates one transitional living home here, right now? Here locally, we have two. We two. have uh, Horizon House, which is in uh, Peyton Place. That is a four bed housing situation for women and um, a men's facility above car house that's called the garage and it's a two bed facility. Certainly there could be a lot more transitional housing locally to be able to support and to be able to get into those facilities you have um, an application, you don't have to be have, you don't have to have been completed with treatment here in Ketchikan. You could have completed residential outside of Ketchikan, uh, but you have to have been just out of residential treatment and then uh, meet the criteria to get in and uh, abide by the rules to stay in. We have two females right now in Horizon House and two males. Uh, of course, because of COVID, we're more cautious about uh, fully putting four women in one spot together um, with the COVID restrictions. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Jose, you had a question? Yeah, I have a follow-up question. You know, um, you guys mentioned that other people have mentioned that readiness for change impacts someone's you know, willingness or ability to change their behavior. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what are the implications of that for someone 
collecting data on readiness to change? No, uh, I think that is something more realistic now. Akila is just hired a director of utilization who uh, the board, our current board is very uh, much interested in outcomes and performance outcomes. So we're beginning to look more closely and not something new to the board. They've been requesting this for probably six years, but with the EHR we currently have and the position of the utilization director, we now have someone who's responsible for those statistics. I certainly will mention that at the next supervision meeting with the senior leadership. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that you're not at max capacity in the recent future. Have you been at max capacity at all in your two-year time here, or has there always been availability? For residential? Yes. Yes, we have. We've, since COVID, we've been at 11, probably three months out of the past 12. Um, that varies, and Estelle will certainly be able to speak to this more, uh, but it, you know, we, we can be fully, fully uh, at full census one day, and then the next day, two people may have to step out for various reasons, whether as the individual was saying, they misacted, or um, they haven't towed the line, because that's a very big aspect of treatment is discipline and learning the rules. Thank you. Estelle, do you want to? I got one for you. Do you want to vote for him? Um, oh, it's all right. Um, hello, my name is Estelle Cowie, and it's a privilege to be standing here before you again. I got to receive the proclamation during the Stomp the Stigma, so uh, thank you for allowing this platform to go on. I have a, uh, a, uh, <laughs> a, a belief that sustains me in the work that I do with people who suffer from substance use disorders as well as mental health disorders. You've heard it said that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Well, it is our job to make them thirsty for something different, a better way of life. Personal recovery is just that. It's as personal to the person as drinking is to an alcoholic. And it has a variety of forms that it can take for the individual who is maybe thinking about something different. You know, we talk about the, the stages of change and wouldn't it be great to track that, uh, those numbers and see what our community is as far as what we are doing, what we need to do and, uh, and what we haven't even considered to do yet. Um, a lot of times, uh, People can spend, in my experience, a long time in what's called the contemplative stage of change, meaning they're thinking about making a change, and here's the key word, but <laughs> they're really not sure uh, about making that change for a variety of reasons. Um, we get to help a person be ready, and we get to make recovery look as attractive as possible uh, for someone who has the sickness. I, um, being a so, uh, me being a social worker, I tend to think that this problem is bigger than that of the individual. I think we have a social problem on our hands. We as a community um, I hold a responsibility to value the dignity and worth of all human beings, regardless of if they suffer from a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder. I mean, for every one person who suffers from a mental health disorder or a substance use disorder, which came first, the chicken or the egg, I don't know anymore. All I know is that we have an omelet on our hands that is both chicken and egg, and frankly, it's too much chicken. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we, we need to be uh, encouraging families to join into the recovery process. We need to be. We need to encourage uh, children uh, to be finding their voice and speaking their truth. When we talk about uh, stigma, we're talking about shame. And uh, one thing I've learned: this disease does not do well when it's brought into the light of day because it thrives on secrets and it thrives on darkness. And that's how shame builds. Um, 
I, you know, I'm also a woman in recovery. I began, I grew up in a, a, a home that was riddled with untreated mental health disorders and also uh, substance use disorders. I remember I found my first reprieve. You see, my mom was enabling a, a fellow drug addict at her job, and her her work said to her, "You either go to treatment or, uh, oh, and go to Al-Anon, which is a 12-step program for people who are affected uh, by people who have substance use disorders, or you're going to lose your job." So of course I went with my mom, and that was the first taste I had of what it was like to be a person in recovery. Where's our Alateen? I grew up in a, a small town, uh, smaller than Ketchikan even, but it was, you know, not beautiful Alaska. There was no Alateen then, there was Al-Anon. Um, we have uh, one meeting of Al-Anon a week, I don't go, um, just because I know people and, and I avoid dual relationships because I, I'm a helper in this profession and it's important for me to keep my private life as, as possible so in order that other people can feel as safe as possible. I hope that makes sense. Um, 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 are there any questions for me? I feel like I'm, I'm rambling a bit and I apologize if that's the case. So I, I have a question and uh, either one of you could answer it. And we talk about barriers. What about the ability to pay for an individual? Does that does that play into any of this at all for them? No, sir. Not with us. Aquila is a non for profit agency. It's one of the reasons I'm employed with them because we're not going to turn a person away because of their inability to pay. Thank you. And in your opinion, what does transitional housing look like? <laughs> uh, well. For me, it looks like uh, a sanctuary, a place to go to uh, after being out and about during the day, a, a place that is uh, free from uh, substances that might make me feel like I'm that you know being powerless over a substance. Uh, in a in a perfect world, it would uh, look like uh, camaraderie. It would look like. Uh, joy, having made it another day uh, in recovery. It would look like uh, being able to uh, have a safe place to lay one's head at night um, with like-minded individuals who are also on a program of recovery. So would this be like a central facility with private sleeping quarters off of it with a commons and a kitchen? Yes, and yes. That type, is that, yeah. is that, it's a that type of a facility? Yes, that's what it would look like. Okay. Councilmember Gage. Ma'am. <laughs> Never ma'am. <laughs> oh, <Julie. laughs> yeah, you know. Um, if you could just pull, if, if money was no object, how many transitional housing places would we need if you could off the top of your head today? 10. 10? Yes. That would house how many pe individuals each? Ten people each. Yes. Yeah. And that would be, would that be um, a combination of substance <laughs> and mental health or um, people with different, various different... Um, you know, like I said, we're dealing with an omelet these days. Yeah. I have seen miracles among people that start working a program of recovery, miracles of mental health, mm -hmm. from people who have a diagnosable mental health disorder. When they start working a program of recovery for their substance use disorder, the, the mental health piece actually falls into place. I, I don't know of... Uh, <laughs> I... I there is not a person that has suffered from a substance use disorder that I have met that didn't meet criteria for some mental health disorder. Right. Yeah. If, if I could mention, when you asked, I, I really am liking hearing the questions about transitional housing because it is a vital aspect of community support. Um, you may be familiar with what Juno's doing uh, with uh, transitional housings. They've put in, I've just heard on the radio, they've put in some individual housing units, small little houses. Uh, that has been something that's been mentioned to me in some meetings. Uh, and it's so obviously probably been talked about in 
higher level meetings uh, out beyond Walmart property. Uh, but a, a few little houses isn't going to meet the need. And little houses, I think, deters from what we're talking about with that like-minded mutual respect for one another, how to live in a community of like-minded individuals in recovery. Because the individuals, our program is a year long, so after a year they exit uh, to enter their community and hopefully they are prepared from what extra services they get that they choose to take part in. They're not required to do any one or another. They're required to be active in their program. But like-minded, recovery-oriented communities is hopefully where they're gonna return when they exit that program. Mr. Floor. Thanks for coming tonight. So we listened to multiple speakers and the one underlying um, thing we hear over and over is recovery begins when the individual, when the person has become ready. And that of course presents an obvious challenge to, to you folks in our community. If there is such a thing as an external mechanism, if there was one external mechanism or a primary external mechanism that might help individuals land at that place where they decide, now I'm ready, what would that be first? Is that a detox? Is it a housing first? What, what do you think? Uh, you know, the thing that uh, tends to uh, people, for people to have that motivational crisis, which is what it's called, uh, is the, the threat of a loss of a job. When a person is threatened with losing their job, that's when they are uh, more likely to seek out resources um, because that's the livelihood. Um. Which is really a conundrum because many of the individuals in treatment don't have employment. They're, that's how they've ended where they are. Ms. Bradbury. For the um, members that are in the Aquila House um, during treatment, are they encouraged to seek work um, during that time, or is there a time period that they're asked to just focus on themselves, or kind of how does that look like? And then secondary, um, if work is allowed, do you guys have a work program set up with anybody in town that can almost teach them skills um, to really create a career to support them and their family potentially? Thank you so much for that question. So Car House is arranged in a phase system. When a person first comes in, they get an orientation phase, which lasts approximately one week long. Um, and then they go into phase one, two, three, four, and then they have a, a transition phase. And it's during that transition phase that they are, in, it's actually a part of the checklist that they need to have signed off. I uh, got a resume. Uh, a lot of our folks utilize the Job Center and DVR. DVR? Yeah, I thought so, good. Um, and we will encourage them to go look for jobs while they are still in program. Um, can, the way that the program is currently set up is that they cannot have employment while they are still inside of Car House because the way that a level 3.5 works is a person has to have 20 hours of clinical contact a week along with a daily structured environment. 20 hours is a lot of hours and when you only have two two hour groups offered a day and then you have the afternoon to go look for a job or take that morning and go look for a job, you, you have to have that clinical contact unless you are right out the door, right? Um, um, and a lot of employers here in uh, the Ketchikan area, from my experience, have really uh, been gracious with our car house graduates. Oh, you've, you've done car house, good for you, right? Really, job well done, when can you start? You know, because car house is not an easy program. L let me be even more clear, recovery is not easy. 
Um, recovery is not for the people that want it. It's not for the people that need it. It is for the people that do the work. Um, and can I just share one other thought? Because we're talking about the person who's actually addicted, but oftentimes the family can be just as affected, if, if not in more pain, than the person who is addicted. Uh, so I think, I don't know what it would look like, but I think we could be doing more when it comes to the families of someone who is suffering from addictive disease. Any other questions for the folks from Aquila? Hey, if Go I ahead. could. So first of all, I want a disclaimer. These aren't necessarily my, my opinions, but you know, there are opinions out there that are um, probably not popular. And one of them is sometimes it seems like these programs reward bad behavior. And as you said, there are some people that come in that they're in jeopardy of losing their job. And so that probably drives them to needing help or losing a family, right? Um, but there are those that are in programs, uh, are, are using programs, whether they be food programs or, or, or I mean, is there, there has to be some accountability and, and where is it that we're enabling this behavior and maybe holding those people off from actually entering treatment? Is that, is that a real issue? It is true that there are a lot of people in the subculture that have become institutionalized. Institutionalized to um, government systems to provide for food, housing. Um, there is a, a marginalization that has occurred. Um, I, and I, there is also a concept known as learned helplessness where we, some people have not ever been taught how to take accountability and responsibility for all of their personal needs. Um, it is true, it is real. I have grappled with myself as a, a clinician and a behavioral health professional, at what point am I enabling this person? And at what point am I serving them? You know what I mean? Yep, I yeah. get it. Uh, and, and I really just have to go back to my own ethics uh, when it comes to that. And I take a look at it from the perspective of, am I really benefiting this person by doing this? Or what is going to serve this person? I am going to continue to treat the person, right? But I am not, it is not right, nor is it prudent to do for a person what they are able to do for themselves. Was that helpful? Yes, it was, thank you. If I can just add in relation to that too, that's a, that's a move that is not uh, appreciated by individuals in a community where it's, it's historical that, say for example, Aquila Gateway historically has possibly been more enabling and we're working now with the 1115 waiver because of the changes that are happening in service providing, we're working toward getting away from enabling and empowering individuals by supporting them and showing them where they can get the supports and then them taking that move and working toward it themselves because we all know it means so much more when we work on something for ourselves. Thank you. Any other questions for them? Thank you very much. Please feel free or to come up and get any of these at the end if you would like some of the brochures or the handouts. Uh, next up, the representative from Ideal Option. My name is Dolores Van Borgendien. I'm a nurse practitioner with Ideal Options. I'm based out of Juneau, but um, I come down to uh, Ketchikan once a week. So I'm normally here on a Tuesday. Um, I heard about the meeting. It's extremely uh, important that we address the situation in the community. Um, 13, I have two medical assistants in my office. They are local young ladies from Ketchikan. And back in May of this year, 
we counted up approximately 13 individuals locally in Ketchikan who had died from overdoses. Um, some of those individuals were outside of the state at the time that they overdosed. Um, some of them were in-state. Only two of them were affiliated with ideal options. And because of HIPAA violations, I can't you know, get into that. Um, I think it speaks to the fact that 11 out of the 13 were possibly not in treatment and not getting medicated-assisted treatment. And what ideal options does is we provide life-saving medications to individuals at a time of need to hopefully get them to therapy or counseling to address other issues. But medicated-assisted medicated treatment is a life-saving treatment. We need to start out initially with harm reduction. Everybody has met uh, Project HOPE. We are a partner with Project HOPE. We did two shipments of Narcan kits, um, approximately 100 kits into Ketchikan between the months of April and about September. We have handed out every single kit. We went back to Project HOPE. Project HOPE was coordinating with Juno and with Public Health in Juno, and there's a massive shipment of uh, kits. They have to be assembled and put together, though, and we are going to work on that. And I do know that Public Health, I hope they're here tonight, I'm not sure whether they are, but they um, were sent a shipment of those kits. The problem with, um, at the moment that we're having is that to reverse a heroin overdose, you probably need one to two Narcans. To reverse a fentanyl overdose, you're needing four plus Narcans. So we're going through twice the amount of kits because there's two Narcans per kit. So we're going through twice the amount of kits in a shorter period of time. We need to get Narcan kits into the hands of the people who need them. I was really pleased to hear from the Wellness Coalition about the sticker system, but we also need to get them into bars because um, you know people working in bars, they see a lot of overdoses and they're the ones that can actually use those Narcan kits. We need to get them into the hands of taxi drivers because they're downtown in the areas where these overdoses are happening. These are suggestions, by the way, from patients of mine. They're the ones that are saying this is where they need to go. Um, we have a bigger problem with fentanyl because of the fact that with heroin, it's a little bit easier to reverse with Narcan and we can also start medicated assisted treatment much earlier. We normally have to wait about 16 hours before we can start Suboxone on patients who've been using heroin. What we're finding though is with fentanyl, and nobody I think has mentioned this, with fentanyl you have to wait. So you cannot have any opiates, any heroin, any fentanyl, anything in your system for 24 hours. For anybody who suffers from substance use, going from your last time of using to 24 hours is horrendous. People are not able to get to that. So we've started what we call a micro-initiation or a micro-induction program at Ideal Options, and it allows individuals to microdose with Suboxone, and while you're increasing your Suboxone, you can decrease the amount of fentanyl that you're using. We started seeing fentanyl-positive toxicology in Ketchikan about a year ago. We ran the numbers in April, there's a huge correlation between the increase. We were running about 4.1% positive toxicology in April. The state of Alaska, in the state of Alaska, Ideal Options, throughout our network, we were running at about 15.5% by July, August. Ketchikan was running at 20%. So Ketchikan is outpacing Anchorage, Juneau, Kenai, all of our other offices. So you have a terrible problem right now. So you now have a town that's flooded with pills. My patients are telling me that there are pills everywhere. I'm not seeing this in Juneau or Kenai. We see a lot of it in Anchorage. But fentanyl is actually easier to get right now in Ketchikan than heroin. So you have a population that's being given fentanyl. They can't even start medication and it's just this hamster wheel that these individuals are on right now. We, everybody's talking about starting patients where they are. Um, where do you see individuals who are using heroin? You see them in the emergency room when they've overdosed. We need to get the hospitals and doctors to start MAT in the ER. We have a referral program. They can refer patients out to us immediately. We will continue them, but they can be bridged over the weekend. That gets them to Monday morning. 
we need to start MAT in the jails. The jails are seeing these patients. I had a young patient in Ketchikan who was doing phenomenal. She was on an extremely low dose of um, buprenorphine. She was doing really, really well. She unfortunately got pulled for a color system for a violation, was not given her medication in jail, and that person has now, since that time we've tried, she has never, ever achieved sobriety again. Had she been given the medication in jail, she might have been given a chance, okay? Um, we have a very robust program. I can provide numbers, statistics, empirical evidence. We run a program in King County Jail. We run a, a program in Benton, Benton County Jail in Washington, okay? The evidence is there. The uh, follow-up rate when you start an individual in jail is really, really high. They get an automatic appointment. They come in and see a uh, clinician the minute that they get out of jail. So their recovery is, is uh, continued. The highest rates of overdose deaths are among those individuals who are released from jail. Um, therapeutic drug court is another vehicle. Individuals can be compelled to join programs like Ideal Options or going into KIC and meeting with doctors in the MAT programs in KIC, and those are also very uh, successful. After that, though, part of the problem is that MAT works great, but it works phenomenally well when you do it in conjunction with therapists and counselors. We have no therapists and counselors. When I try to refer patients out to individuals, as somebody mentioned, no one's accepting Medicaid. The cost is $100 to $200 per session. These individuals need approximately a minimum of, say, 26 sessions, depending on what type of therapy you do. So individuals cannot pay for this. Um, most, of, most of the individuals, I'm going to say 99% of the individuals that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, start their drug or substance use in childhood. Coming to Alaska and speaking to individuals here every single day, the story was over and over again. I started at 11 years old with weed and alcohol in the home, either with the permission of the parents or just using in the home. By age 13 or 14, these individuals were using and experimenting with ecstasy, some hallucinogens, um, uh, mushrooms. By the age of 15 or 16, they were now experimenting with methamphetamines. By age 16, 17, they had found opiates and pills. And when the pills ran out previously, <laughs> when pills ran out, they then progressed to using heroin, normally snorting, smoking, and ended up injecting. And then began the whole prodrome of incarceration, treatment, MAD, MAT programs, relapse, et cetera. And this just keeps going on. If we do not address PTSD in our young population, if we do not address adverse childhood events, this cycle will just continue. We need to also look at case management for individuals once they get out. Um, Jim Harriman, I think, mentioned um, housing. The Glory Hall in Juneau has just opened. They have a 45-bed individual room housing facility for the homeless. It gives individuals dignity. They have their own room, their own key, their own door, their own closet. It's somewhere where they can live. They're not on the streets anymore. In addition to that, Housing First has housing. And in the Glory Hall Center now, they're also putting in Teal Street, just the name of the street, and they are housing Front Street Clinic for medical services and also JAMI and reentry groups. So all of these services are now going to be located within walking distance, okay? We need to address the medical issues of these individuals. I'm going to say probably about 20 to 30 percent of all of my patients are now hep C positive. So that has to be addressed as well. State of Alaska will pay for hep C treatment and actually in the long run, the savings to the state is huge because they're now not dealing with the, with the health um, uh, problems associated with hep C. We need to look at jobs for individuals. We also need to bring together um, all of the uh, uh, stakeholders. Not many people know, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today, NAMI in Juneau, um, but it's available to Ketchikan and every, it's available to every person in Alaska. Apparently they have $2,500 grants for individuals for things like transportation. If they can't get to their appointments 
or their car's broken down, there's money available to them to get their cars fixed. There's money available to them for housing and for other things. But like a lot of people don't know that these things are there and available for the individual. Reentry has money, I do know that. Reentry and Juno, they also have money for individuals that will include housing. And Alaska Mental Health Trust also has money and funding available to these individuals. When we're talking about acute detox facilities, Ketchikan does not have a detox facility. I was very glad to hear that the hospital was um, bringing that up. Um, the problem with the acute detox facility and the problem with a lot of places is the fact that you don't have the trained personnel. And I did met here, Jim and Estelle mentioned that. So I do, in, um, in Juneau, when Rainforest opened their detox facility, I think they, they had an issue initially because they didn't have trained nurses. And you need specifically trained nurses to deal with individuals who are detoxing in acute detox. And the same thing happened as well with um, Central uh, Peninsula Hospital in Kenai. Um, one of the reasons I'm here is because in, in Ketchikan, and I'm only here once a week, is because we can't get a provider in Ketchikan. So we can't find a nurse practitioner or, an, or a PA or an individual who will come in and work our clinic here in Ketchikan. So I fly down, it's easy for me to fly down every Tuesday to do that. With regards to access to inpatient treatment centers, the system is a little bit fractured. Um, they were talking, individuals were talking about the assessments to get a person in. To get a person into most treatment facilities, you need a medical history and physical, you need an ASAM assess assessment, and some of the facilities also want a, a mental health assessment. Those assessments have to be done within a space of 30 to 45 days, depending on the treatment facility. And what happens is, is when you send someone out to go to get a doctor's appointment, they wait 14 days to get the next one, and they wait 20 days to get the next, which makes the first history and physical invalid because it's now over 30 days. And you're caught in this conundrum again. In addition to that, referring people out to facilities, um, a lot of them will turn around and say they don't have the capacity to take an individual because of a co-occurring mental health disorder. So the, that patient may be too acute because of a mental health disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, but they can't treat their substance use. So you run into a problem there. Um, I'm very glad that um, Ketchikan has decided to hold this meeting tonight, okay? I think we do have to go back to the fact that 13 individuals thereabouts have died since the beginning of this year. This is a population of under 9,000 people. Everyone has been touched. Everyone in this community has been touched by this. And I apologize, I lost a patient here who was doing very, very well two years in recovery. And I saw this patient two days before they overdosed. And I could not have predicted it. So, if you have any questions. Any questions? Ms. Bradbury. Um, so, it sounds like you have a fairly large presence in Juneau. Um, you mentioned that you were struggling finding somebody to work here in Ketchikan. What is the barrier of finding somebody? Like, do people tell you why they won't work down here, or um, is it a problem all over Southeast Alaska finding people to work in this field? We have no provider in Fairbanks either, and we've okay. not seen them. Okay. So it's very hard to bring people up. I moved here from South Florida. Okay. Um, and then second, uh, secondly, besides finding uh, a clinician for this area, um, what could our community do to support kind of growing your presence in our community as such other places in Alaska? Um, is there things that we can do to help promote or to encourage or um, maybe partner with you guys to help add you to our mix of tools to try to fix this or I think to support them? We were working very hard with the hospital, for example, uh, and the ER and Dr. Nielsen at the beginning of COVID. And then unfortunately COVID came along. And I think that if, if individuals were aware that you can get immediate same day referrals or referrals over the weekend, if the ER physicians can start patients um, on Suboxone immediately and get them into us, in addition to that, if we could just, I mean, the biggest problem is the therapists and the counselors as well, if we just had more resources available to us. Any other questions? Mr. Gass. I have a question and might not, I mean, if anyone has the answer, feel free to chime in, but uh, 
I've heard it mentioned a few times now that these folks a lot of times need the counseling, but the counselors won't take the Medicare or Medicaid. Okay. Does anyone know why that is? Is, is it? M Medicaid reimbursement, reimbursement, reimbursement rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, reimbursement rate. Isn't, it isn't so much that counselors won't take Medicaid, it's that Medicaid won't pay. Medicaid will only pay certain entities. And here, uh, it's, it's uh, Gateway and KIC. I'm sorry, it's Gateway and KIC and Ideal Option. I don't know, uh, I don't think that there are any private practice people in town in, in my field that Medicaid will pay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is anyone here from public health? Oh, there you are. You were hiding behind the camera. I couldn't see it. Hey, I'm Arizona Jacobs. I'm the lead nurse at the Ketchikan Public Health Center. So I think the question is, what are we doing right now, right? Uh, well, mostly COVID, um, but we're also giving out Narcan kits to anybody who walks in. Um, and we do a lot of risk reduction counseling, so use your fentanyl test strips. We did get them, by the way. Um, and then also a lot of risk reduction related to HIV, um, AIDS, and Hep C. So if you're gonna use IV drugs, let's learn how to wash a needle. We, we do some of that education. Um, we refer for uh, primary care, I guess, but really our role is prevention and risk reduction and resource acquisition. So we do help people apply for Medicaid, but obviously Medicaid's not gonna fix it all. Um, what we would like to do is we would like to do more education, but uh, mostly we're just doing COVID right now. Uh, but that's about to change. So we're getting some government relief workers to come in and help us with staffing. We're profoundly understaffed. And then we will have one nurse who is dedicated to uh, joining the Peers Task Force and uh, working with these guys to, to do more of that. When we think about providing education, we really want to target high density areas. Um, we want to start with schools, obviously. We've got some youngsters in there, so let's empower them. Then we want to think about uh, large business places. So, um, you know, one of our largest employers is the school district. Uh, we also want to look at jails. Um, homeless shelters are a big deal. Uh, community events, shelters, uh, other than like our primary homeless shelter. The U.S. Coast Guard has asked us to come out as well and do some training for some of the people on their boats. Um, yeah, so some of the barriers to doing that are COVID and staffing, <laughs> which is really, really understaffed. Um, and then some of the things that I would love to see happen are uh, a needle exchange program would be fantastic. And uh, finding a place to house that would also be fantastic. And then, uh, yeah, maybe asking, since we are going to have one nurse who is ded dedicated to this, her name is Carrie, uh, maybe if people would like education, call us up, give us uh, like three different dates to choose from because COVID. Um, but, you know, time, location, audience, and then we'll kind of see what we can do to, to work that in. Is there any, I, I, I'm aware you guys have seen a huge drop off in, in nurses over the last few years. Is there any chance of that, you know, turning around at all? Or are we just going to have to deal with the fact that, that we have fewer public health nurses going forward? I really can't predict predict that, but uh, nurses are not just leaving their, their posts and switching careers, they are switching, you know, specialties, they're, they're leaving the profession entirely. So I don't see that improving anytime soon. It's kind of okay. been a hard job. So what is, what is your staff at your facility presently for public health? As in how many nurses do we have? Four. And what would be the ideal um, to serve the community at Ketchikan? Seven. Thank you. 
Other question? Go ahead, Jen Lee. A needle exchange program. So if a needle, needles, yeah. If people are going to use IV drugs, then they may as well use ones that don't have hep C. Yeah. And that's also good for, you know, most of us because uh, who gets infected when you have somebody who is using? That'd be, that'd be me because we have accidental needle sticks and we're handling needles all the time, so um, then we take care of you, so. Yes, go ahead. Anybody who shows up at our facility who wants to dispose of their needles is, is welcome to do that. So that's a good disposal way. There's always that question of, am I enabling a person or am I providing a resource? And um, I think that's a really subjective answer you can't really give. Yeah, I don't have a concern about that. But I do know that yeah. I have numerous family members and addictions in this community, and that is the fear of theirs, that if they come into any facility, these are not secure, um, and to make everyone here aware, that is one of their concerns. I do know at Walmart um, and Safeway, numerous addicts buy needles, and they're not, there isn't this conversation with the community and the council of, of getting rid of these needles. They need these kind of programs to feel comfortable to go and exchange for these needles. It's also important to remember that, you know, they may be buying these needles, but uh, it, it may not be, they may be asking for something like insulin and then they're given needles. So if it was, you know, less stigmatized and then we could also provide counseling at the time we're giving out needles, that would be super yeah. awesome. Ms. Bradbury. Um, what is one of the barriers, besides the staffing in COVID, obviously, um, what is a barrier to starting that? Is it funding? Is it, um, is it community support? Kind of what, what would you need besides staff and getting over COVID or post-COVID? What, what do you need to achieve that? I think that there is probably somebody in this audience who has more historical knowledge about uh, a needle exchange program. I think there were attempts to make that. I don't know if we decided uh, who was the best person to house the program. So I, I don't, I, I think there was efforts previously. I don't know why they failed. I think that's something to look into. Other questions for public health? Thank you. I noticed uh, Mayor, Mayor Dial and several assembly members out there. I was wondering if you guys, if you wanted to address us tonight or if you had any thoughts to share or you don't have to. I just, I'm, I'm glad you're here though. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I'll get. He's on my list. I'm waiting for him to jump up and wave at me. Uh, well, thank you, Mayors. I actually came here just to listen tonight. I, um, I, I need to make this disclosure. I'm not speaking for the borough. I'm speaking as mayor and not speaking for the assembly. They would have to debate any proposals we would have. Um, but as most of you know, I spent 25 years in law enforcement, majority of it here in Ketchikan. I retired in 2015 as the acting commander. And this issue has plagued our area for a long time. Uh, we know that most of the drugs coming into this community come through Seattle, one way or another, either in the mail or um, uh, by the marine lines, by the freight systems, uh, sometimes on the airlines. And as we start to see those holes develop in law enforcement down in 
uh, Seattle, Bellingham, you know, we can expect that we're going to see more of those drugs come up here. And for about the last decade, we've had a dedicated drug enforcement officer with the state troopers here, and, and they have partnered with the Ketchikan Police Department. And they've been very effective in pulling a large quantity of drugs off the street. And I guess, you know, listening to everything here tonight, I would say that, you know, looking back just from a law enforcement perspective, probably one of the greatest failures that we had was when communities across the country started decriminalizing the possession of small amounts of, uh, of drugs. And, and I understand why they did that. They did that because they really didn't want to stigmatize people that were addicts. Nobody really wants to, to, to punish somebody who's addicted. But by doing that, what we did was we, we prevented um, or we eliminated the largest um, hammer that we had for getting people into treatment because a lot of times we would arrest somebody for possession of small amounts of narcotics. They would go before the court and the court would say treatment or jail. And so we started losing that and that's kind of one of the reasons why if you go to Seattle right now, um, you're, you're going to see that evidence of that addiction all over the place. Um, it used to be more hidden in the past and it's really not now. And you know that's starting to kind of migrate up here. And so all that to say, you know, if you wanted to have some big proposal where we could actually have a takeaway, where we could actually come together as elected bodies and maybe do something to address this, you know, we'd first start with how much money are we willing to invest in it. And I would really argue for uh, more enforcement efforts, maybe hire another investigator for the Ketchikan Police Department. Because one investigator in this community on an annual basis will pull thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of doses off the streets. And if, and, and if you think about that, I mean, some of these major busts, and we've read about it in the paper over just these last few years, if, if you make one bust and you pull 10,000 doses off the streets of Ketchikan, think of that impact and think of, you know, the impact we could have if we could up that interdiction. And so I guess, you know, we're open. Um, I'm definitely open to considering anything that the bodies would would want to put forward. But I think it's going to one take money, and and two, I really need to. I think we need to really look at what's the best bang for our buck. And my argument would be that if you want to get more drugs off the street, uh, then we really need to to maybe get another investigator or two. Um, and then I'll just kind of close with this. A couple of years ago, I had a proposal where. We would have taken some of our tobacco tax revenue. We would have actually um, partnered with the city and used that to hire additional investigators. And during the school year, those officers would be in the schools providing school security and drug enforcement or drug education. And then in the summer, you would have them for you know your cruise ship passengers and those kind of things. So maybe we can think of something like that going forward, where um, maybe we could hire a couple extra officers. We could use them in our schools during the school year. Um, maybe use them uh, for a drug interdiction and for uh, dealing with our tourism in, in the summer. You know, something like that. I think that's doable, and uh, you know, I appreciate this format, and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, the idea of, uh, of housing is coming up several times, and I know that the borough has been looking at additional housing options for the community. Could you give us a brief update on, on where that stands? Yeah, absolutely. So for many years, Housing has been a, a primary focus of the assembly. We all know that we have a deficit. Uh, affordability is an issue. It's getting worse all the time, especially with the increase in building supplies. Uh, one of the things we would like to do is if we get some federal infrastructure dollars, we would actually uh, like to have maybe have a proposal where we will build some roads out to borough land that's previously landlocked realizing that the cost of road construction is one of the primary impediments to, to uh, bringing new subdivisions online, new housing online. So if we could get that process jump-started by using federal or state dollars to build some roads out to, to this area so that developers could then go in and, and it would lower their cost for development, um, you know, we think that's got some merit. We think that's a possibility. Um, you know, we've also, we've had assembly members like A.J. Pierce who's looked at tiny home issue and, and to try to do that. But kind of what we're hearing from developers is, 
is just to develop a standard lot now, and I, I think we do have some in this audience who could speak to it better than me, but they're looking at like $150,000 just to develop a lot to put a house on it. So whether it's a really small house or a really big house, it, you know, um, the issue is we got to find ways to bring down those costs for our developers, and that's really why we're trying to focus on maybe we can do something in that regard if we can find some money, maybe get some roads built. Actually, I have a suggestion for the road thing. A couple years ago when we were up at AML Forest Service, if you make parts of um, areas recreational, they will actually fund roads um, up to 50000 each year. You just have to keep reapply, uh, reapplying. So, yeah, I... I just, it was at one of our meetings, I can pull the old paperwork. <laughs> I, if you have some information on that, please send it over. Yeah. I want to make sure staff knows about that. Thank you. I remember what meeting I brought it up here, but it was a few years back, so. But I'll find it. Senator Gass. Yeah, thanks for coming, Rodney. Uh, is there, you mentioned looking at getting federal dollars for building those roads. Are there, has the borough gone so far as to identify areas that they have in mind? I mean, is there specific areas? And if so, would you care to speak to that or is that still in the works? You know, I, I know the manager is up on that. I can't speak to that specifically, but he has been working with the planning department to kind of identify areas where, you know, if, if we could get some funding, we can build the roads out to it. I, I just don't know it off the top of my head. I think some may be in the Ward Cove area. We do have some federal or uh, borough land out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bynum. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, thank you guys for the opportunity to pull this together so we can have a discussion about an important topic, which is addiction and opioid, opioid use. Uh, this issue has likely affected all of us um, personally or our families. And I don't think anyone in this room is immune from that. It's a complicated issue with lots of difficult solutions ahead of us. I'd like to say, and I don't want to steal their thunder, but uh, thank you to Member Landis and uh, McQuarrie for putting together a write-up on this to bring it. This is a, an issue in front of the Assembly. But I also say that I'm not here speaking on behalf of the members of the Assembly, but only for myself. There's many questions ahead of us when this, about this topic, and that's questions for local government. What policies will we put forth to help address this issue? Questions for our health care providers, what kind of care they're going to be able to give to our community. NGOs and providing services, law enforcement intervention, and other organizations that are participating to try to solve this issue. On August 4th, the city, borough, Saxman, and community members got together to talk about homelessness. And we had a round table policy discussion to talk about these issues. One of the positive things that came from that roundtable discussion is, is that each member that was represented was able to have a dialogue and we got together in the room and we were able to talk about some of the policies that the borough, the city of Ketchikan, the city of Saxman, and the different organizations were able to contribute to help solve the problem. So although we're talking about this tonight, I hope it doesn't stop here tonight when we're talking about the addiction issue. I hope that we can formulate a roundtable discussion with all of the important players that are involved here tonight to really talk about what are those policy directions that we want from our local governments. How can we coordinate with the organizations here to provide care and ensure that there's no duplication of service, and that we can get people to those organizations so that they can get care when they want care. How do we get appropriate requests to the state and federal government? 
for assistance? And how do we get a measured path forward? So my only request is, is that we don't stop here tonight on this, but we actually have that kind of a roundtable discussion where we can really get into the actual solutions that we need to put together as a community, not just from the governmental perspective, but from the organizations that are here that want to care for our citizens. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, I'm right in the back. I'm sorry. I was gonna... So you catch can reentry coalition first. If Jeff come up. Uh, my name is Jeff Bullock. I'm part of the uh, Ketchikan Reentry Coalition, which is under the uh, umbrella of the Wellness Coalition, which I'm going to talk to Ramana tomorrow about why she didn't mention this earlier. Uh, anyway, we, we work with guys and women coming out of prison who, who don't have any hope, who don't have any avenues. I remember uh, one of the most frustrating things I did was in working with these guys when they had all this COVID money floating around, um, was going, hey, do these guys qualify? They don't have a place, but if you give them some COVID funding for housing, they could find a place. Nope, you, gotta, you, know, you have to have a place to get the funding. I called the Department of Labor and asked about um, you know, the, the extra benefits of uh, unemployment, and because they've been down, they haven't worked the last six months, they didn't qualify for unemployment. So in talking to them, and as we've heard tonight, the big thing is housing. Where's a good, safe place to live? Because these guys and women coming out of prison don't have any options. What do they do? They go hang with their using buddies. And the cycle starts again. So we had a, a, an idea of talking to the, the trust. I believe the, the lady from Ideal Options says that, uh, you know, Juno has some money for housing the Reentry Coalition there. Um, the trust is a, did a yeoman's job. And they gave us $50,000 to find safe housing. Uh, KIC kicked in another $10,000, and we found a five-bedroom apartment that has been probably 93% occupied since we opened the doors back at the end of February. Um, we need to expand that. Um, so, so we've heard a lot of ideas what the Rancher Coalition is. We need another $50,000 to, to add five more rooms. And we're working with KIC with their reentry program. Um, and, and there's a good meld. We, we have a lot of KIC people in our house while they wait to go into the KIC system. Uh, we have people who are waiting for bed and treatment. We have people on probation, but you know what, they're safe. Um, it's not probation, they're not, they're not watched 24 hours, um, but they get a chance to put their big boy pants on and, and try to get back into the community. And, and I'm a felon, and, and you know, luckily I had the support but the people I deal with don't. Um, so we started little, right? We bought them waterproof backpacks. We brought them duffel bags. When you get out of prison, you don't get to go to Target and pick out your Samsonite, right? You get a garbage bag. So we tried to take away a lot of the shame, a lot of the embarrassment, um, and then grant them back in the community. And I think we've done a, a really good job. But we need money, because <clears throat> those five bedrooms are full. They've been full. They'll be full until the money runs out. And, and so expanding that takes five more people off the street and puts them in a safe place to live while they work on getting their life together. It, is it the, the perfect answer? Not at all. But, but sometimes you gotta work from the bottom up instead of the top down. And, and we are, as a community, um, that's a glaring omission for uh, people that need help or, or the people coming out of the prison system that have absolutely nothing but have an open couch at their that they're using buddies, and, and that's what we're trying to stop. So that was my pitch. But I, I thank you guys for doing this. Um, it, we need to talk about it, but we need to do something. You know, we, we've talked about this. I mean, Dave and I went to high school together. Drugs, drugs were there. And, well, Dave's a lot older than I am, but, um, you know, it's, it's there. <laughs> not going to bite me up anymore, are you? <laughs> um, and, uh, you so know, much for that $50,000. Yeah, <laughs> meeting adjourned, I know. Uh, but anyway, but thank you for the, for the dialogue, and, and there's a lot of great ideas, um, but, you know, we need to get real, and we could talk uh, everybody's ears off about what the hospital does, what Aquila does, what KIC does. We need a catch-can solution, and, and that's what I'm hoping we can start with, 
with this meeting tonight is, is doing something for catch can by catch can. That's all. Do you have a question, Ms. Bradbury? Um, yes. Would a permanent housing solution like buying a house be um, like what you ultimately would go for? Or would you need a facility that has private rooms but yet areas that they can congregate? Kind of what, it, what would be the ideal situation for those members trying to re-enter into uh, the community? Uh, I, you know, if there was a building, you know, when we started the process, we talked to John Scoblick at Trident, you know, about their bunkhouse. We talked to Doug Andrews at Gilmore saying, hey, you shut the Gilmore down in the winter, what would it cost? Um, we, we looked everywhere. And we, we had a landlord, Jesse Hoyt, who's been really helpful, um, took a flyer on us. He said, hey, I'll rent you guys. No background checks, no deposit. Um, we'll, we'll take care of you guys. So I, I think if we could buy, if we could lease from somebody, you know, anything that has 10 rooms, uh, I, I think that would be the, the next step where we're at. And, and we're, we're talking with KIC, and I think KIC um, is willing to look at, at something like that too. But it's like the trust. You know, we got the, the money from the trust, the 50000 they said, boy, we sure would like to see some community partners. And, th and they gave us that much because it was a brand new program. And so it'd be really cool to go back to the trust and, and say, hey, we have community partners. Here's what we want to do in our next step and, and grow our partnership. Other questions? Oh, Mr. Mr. Gass. So you think, uh, theoretically speaking, if, say, we made some sort of a deal where the city were to give you some money, you go back to the trust, they would match it. Is that what you're getting at? They, they would, I don't know if it would be a one-to-one -one match, but between the city, the KIC, um, and others, I, I, we'd get to where we need to be pretty quickly. Other questions? No, they have my cell number, and so I do emotional support at <laughs> 2 in the morning. But, um, you know, it, it's something that, that we work with all the agencies. All the agencies in this room, you know, we kind of are the advocate for the people coming out of prison. We, we try to get the assessments. We try to get them into counseling. Um, we're, we're on their team, and, and in a lot of times, we're the first arrow in their quiver uh, when they come out of prison. And, and so we, we feel we've been pretty effective doing that. But we do not offer any direct services other than housing. Thank you. Is there anyone here from the community of Saxman? Come on up. Thank you, uh, thank you for putting this on. I've um, I've been sitting back there thinking about what I wanted to say, and you know, there's a lot of people in my family that struggle with this, and I'm not gonna say it's not a problem. It is a problem. And I can tell you, and I want to turn around so everybody can see me, but I can tell you that if Saxman, it's been a lot of work, but if Saxman's three entities can get together, if Saxman's three entities can get together to move us forward, and it sounds like there's money here. It sounds like we all need to, the heads of these organizations got to get together. You know, we're talking about roads. We're talking about, you know, where to put this. For God's sake, we have land all over. And I think, you know, it's, it's time that, you know, and I don't know, I don't have time to do it because I was working on 
trying to get Saxman together. Joe Williams tried for 26 years and it took me six months. And so I, you know, like I said, I don't know who, who, who has the time to, to start putting this together, but I think, and I don't know what the, who has the, I don't know, um, the, the stats on who's, when it comes to um, what the native population is that uses. But it, 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 to me, I, I, I want to say it's high, but it's, it's besides the point. I think that this is a very good start to uh, moving forward and getting out of this this rut that we're in. Um, you know, Saxman, we don't have, the, the city council had put um, um, so people can come to the, the, the community center and use it as an AA center. That had, nobody's really come forward and done that. There hasn't been a leader to step up to that, but that's about all we're doing. Oh, that's all we have. We don't have a lot of money. Um, you know, there's a lot of money for us to go after, and we're going to work to try to better for Saxman. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I noticed someone raised their hand way, way in the back there. Do you want to come up and address us? We'll get there too. Yep, you're on there. Got that list too. I feel like an air traffic controller up here. Hello, my name's Marcella. Sorry, I've got stage fright, but um, I've lived in this community long enough and I've also traveled down south to see what I think we as a community can improve on. And I've heard a lot of good ideas today and I really am going for the needle exchange. My friends have opened one in California and the first year that they opened it, they noticed a huge decrease in AIDS, HIV, hepatitis. Um, they also offered vac vaccinations there like for hepatitis and I think that would be great. It also cleaned up the streets. Um, I heard a little bit about um, a place where you can put, you know, transitional housing maybe out of the way. And I, I've noticed some things down in Washington, the tiny home thing didn't go so well. And I think we could probably improve on that by making it out of the city way, but also kind of make it like a friendly, gated community in a weird way because having that barrier kind of gives you like a sense of security, especially for people who are transitioning from that. Um, but also in the jail, providing Suboxone to people and Narcan training, maybe with CPR combined in high school because most of these kids in high school also have addict parents. And if we were to teach high schoolers how to administer Narcan with CPR, that would also take a lot of the stress off the ER. And also, I heard from a few people who are current addicts, I'm not sure if this is true for ideal options, but I know that at Peace Health, they don't offer a lower milligram for Suboxone, so a lot of people try and taper and microdose on Suboxone and they don't have two or four milligram strips. So a lot of people just try and cold turkey and then they end up taking Xanax and start using the substance abuse and a lot of those pills are being now cut with fentanyl. But yeah, that's just uh, my thing is harm reduction, a place where you can like bring your drugs to and get them tested or even giving out test kits yourself because 
people aren't going to stop using fentanyl, but it would cut down on overdoses if they knew what was inside their drugs. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Any questions for Marcella? Thank you very much. Okay, that takes care of the, the groups that were going to make presentations. Were there, any, were there any groups that I missed somehow that people came in and I missed them? Didn't think so. Okay. Moving on to persons to be heard. The first person we have on here is Wally Klingelhut. in the city. Um, just a drip. I was never a spurt. Uh, experts. <laughs> uh, this has been around for a long time. I have it on good authority that this alcoholism has been around for a couple thousand years. Um, this, uh, oh, the, he says, uh, how come you saved the good wine to last, you know? supposed to put that out first and serve the rot gut later. So it tells me that there's a little alcoholism's been around for a while. And then I, I find in here too, and this is the problem, the main problem with homelessness is I find that in here in, uh, in, uh, in James. It says, uh, uh, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. And, oh, you know, I know I've done it. I'm guilty too. Uh, hence, that's why I got dressed up. <laughs> well, what, what the homeless, I, I guess I, I put down self on the deal and I, I, the homeless are not going to be here to represent themselves. So, seeing as how I have a bunch of friends there and and uh, what I've suggested uh, I want to thank this city council and and uh, the mayor and, and all the support that you've given me over the years uh, transitional living center went away for lack of funding is what it was and and uh, it was uh, out of that Danita Nelson got that day shelter going and, and, and some other people involved in trying to do that. But primarily right now, what the homeless need is a home. A home. See, you know, we tell, and I'm, I'm not sure that the city or the borough or, or government can do that um, because there's a difference. We, in, in government, we talk about housing. And uh, when TLC was formed, it was on a gray background coming out of the mist. And then there was a triangle represented the house. And right in the center of the house was a big old heart. You know, home is where the heart is. And you, you can't, you can't just throw money at this. You can't, you gotta, if there's no love, you're wasting your time. If you don't care and just throw money at it, you're just spinning your wheels. What, therefore, if someone could get an NGO similar to Transitional Living, uh, I know um, the need is long gone now, and, and, uh, but that was the original thing with that and out of the day center and and I even cautioned them at the time that um, try and do it all together because if you get one going like the day center it'll the rest of the dreams will be put on the wayside um, I've suggested to different places the day center Salvation Army and everything what they really need right now is a uh, someone, some place where they can store their belongings without them getting ripped off. I mean, and when they go out to get a, you know, they can get cleaned up at the day shelter and, 
and, uh, and get some clothes from the Salvation Army and go out and apply for a job and, 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 and try to do something. But, and even, you know, uh, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna take their shopping cart with them to the job interview that'll never work? You know, <laughs> and so you gotta have some place safe and secure where they can keep their belongings. That's the first step. And the second step is housing, not just trans transitional living center is a step toward that housing, but even getting a job um, so you can eat and take care of yourself, housing is so expensive at catch a can that uh, you're gonna need a very good job. And even when TLC was there, I, um, again, here we go back to the treating people differently. Um, th th we didn't have a, uh, uh, the job service at the time didn't have a, a day, la day labor service. They used to call me, but I used to get a lot of calls like, I need four guys to move this piano up six flights of, of stairs, and I'm willing to pay them $2 an hour. And I'd tell them, hey, we don't do Billy Robert jobs, buy it. Mm -hmm. you know, and so, but that's, that's the way it works. And what are you gonna do with that? And then even those people that got decent jobs, working at Safeway in different places, um, Housing, still a problem because, and then the, the thing of it is, is it's the hopelessness of the situation. Uh, you, somebody messes up, they go to jail, uh, maybe get a DUI, something like that. Uh, and uh, they lose their job for, you know, go to jail. Well, a couple of them, they're stupid. And, and get a couple of DUIs and go to jail. Get, and now, now, uh, they lose their job, the wife and kids go on welfare. Um, they get, do their time, and now they, they got this on their record, and, uh, and now they're gonna go look for a job, and, and now the wife and kids are on welfare, well, he's gotta pay that money back, and if he gets behind in them payments, they pull his driver's license away, <laughs> even if he was able to get it back, and then he's, pay, he's under the gun the rest of his life. Hopelessness, yeah. And so they throw up their hands and say, can't do anything, you know. And so we really do place an undue burden on stupidity. Uh, this is something, that's something you guys can't address except at the state and federal level. Uh, you know, that, uh, and, and part of the reason I brought that up is, uh, oh, Forty years ago, I was, uh, because of hospital and doctor bills and everything, I was in real, real, <laughs> between a rock and a hard place. I was able to work my way out of it and repay that $67,000. But, and then again, here we go with the treatment. We take these people through treatment and spend all this money and, and, uh, and now they get out and they're trying to find a job to, that maybe has some health insurance in case <laughs> they have to go back in or whatever and, and then repay all that. Well, you know, and they want to do it because it's not, you know, an ability to hold their head up, you know, and that's the point of the job too. It's not the money, but be a productive person in society and being able to hold their head up again. Um, so, uh, housing, and but right now, immediately, if not sooner, some place to store their belongings so that they can, you know, at least enable them to go out and find it. And uh, and, and this is oh the other thing I I uh, uh, there is a, a young woman in this town that picked up a four-year sobriety coin in February. I, I'm not going to take credit for that um, because that was God's doing. But 
I was available on Christmas Eve before that. The jail didn't want her, wish wouldn't take her. The hospital wouldn't even take her to detox her. Um, I got a call on Christmas Eve and, you know, well, what are we going to do? Throw her in the ditch and let her die? So I babysat her with the G and <laughs> boost and whatever, and, and then got, got that taken care of, got her taken care of, got her set up and sobered up and, and uh, got her into a place where she could stay for a while and, and uh, she's alive today. Isn't that wonderful? And I, I've got lots of stories like that, but it's the heart. I think maybe for right now it's the it's the uh, trying to find a home, find an, a non-GO to where you can have a home again, because that's why it worked. That's why it worked. It was it was a fellowship. It was a home. And I'm not talking about building some Taj Mahal here with uh, all the niceties here. I'm talking about some kind of a facility like <laughs> we moved into when DLC started, you know, 10 coats of different colors of paint and none of the plumbing working. See, because when they come in there, they take ownership. When they start cleaning up and painting and fixing things up, they take ownership of it. And, it, and it's that ownership. That's the important, because that's where the love is at. That's where the home is at. Otherwise, it's just a, another facility, another jail, another whatever. That's enough out of me. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Inglebot? Thank you, Boyd. Grant Echohawk. Sure, go, yeah. Um, if they want to talk, I, I hadn't, hadn't planned on it, but if they wanted, if they, wanted they can. Okay. Mayor, Council, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having this conversation tonight. It, it's obviously important, and um, you know, I, <laughs> The, the irony of, of um, horrible irony is, um, as I'm sitting here listening to, to the comments, I'm being contacted by my mother, who uh, is um, urging me to go check on my brother. So as soon as I'm done here, I'm gonna have to leave and go check on him, because um, he does, he does, um, he may be in trouble. Uh, I, I think he's okay, I, I just finally got a text back from him. But, so I'm very intimately familiar with, with what, what um, you know, what we're talking about here. And so I just wanted to add a couple of, uh, some items of context. Um, you know, what, and, and this was touched on, I really appreciate Dr. Jose bringing it up, and, and, but a couple of different folks brought it up, is, is a lot of what we're facing today started, um, you know, started, long, started when, when folks were children. Childhood trauma um, really has an impact on, on a lot of people's lives. And, and so as we're having this conversation, it's absolutely vital that we, that we um, do not forget that we have to make sure that we reach out to as many children as we can and find, um, find um, safe solutions for them, for their families, and give them the support that they need. Um, I, I can assure you that uh, the, you know, the, the circumstances which, which um, that has, uh, has brought myself and my siblings into some difficult times in our lives, um, what the, 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 the what pulled us out, um, there were, there's no amount of, of punitive actions that could have pulled us out. It was, it, was, it was compassion. It was an abundance of compassion. That's what led us and, and nudged us back into the right direction where we needed to go. So I just urge this council and to, to, to remember as we're having this conversation, when we talk about destigmatizing things, really what we're talking about is, is, is making sure that we have an overabundance of, an overabundance of compassion for the folks that they, they simply need help. Uh, we have members of our community 
um, American citizens who need help. And, and so I'm just thrilled that this conversation is happening. Um, I, I agree 100% that it is a, it is a borough-wide, um, borough-wide, community-wide issue that's gonna take all of us, all of us addressing it, trying to get everybody on board, everybody on the same page. And, and uh, you know, at, at, the, at the end of the day, we're, we're all better for it. But I, I think the, the consistent theme here is that, you know, we need money, we, we need funding. Funding to, to operate, you know, if, if we want a, um, a state-of-the-art facility with, with counselors and, and professionals and, and to support our existing organizations, all of that takes money, even, even to develop roads. You know, uh, we, we, just, we just heard from Mayor Dial about maybe we'll get state and federal funding. All of that, all of those are, uh, and just about all of our programs are tax dollar funded. And so, um, you know, and I wanna touch on that because I, I think a lot of folks, um, you know, uh, you know they're, they're right now is a, is a broader conversation about making sure that we have basically everybody paying their fair share of taxes. And, and I think it's important that we talk about that because we do need these tax dollars. We do need to be able to fund these, these programs and making sure that if there are um, entities or individuals that, could, that, could, that, 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 are, that are essentially making sure that they're actually contributing to some of the things that we, as a community, we need help with. Um, so, you know, I, I basically want to, again, this conversation went a little sideways as I, as I'm um, receiving my text messages, but um, ultimately I showed up just to offer my support and to say I, I appreciate this conversation. It is very meaningful and I thank you for keeping it going. And um, anything that we want to do uh, as a community, it is, it is going to take funding. It's going to take uh, uh, all of us um, working together. And, and, and I'm excited to however, however this conversation goes. I really am, so I appreciate it. Um, I guess any, any questions? All right, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Ms. Stevenson, Mary Stevenson. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Stevenson. I heard a great deal of information tonight. I'm very impressed that there are a lot of service providers out there that are trying. I also hear that they're individually and not collectively pooling their resources. Uh, they've got war stories that they're afraid to even mention for fear of retribution from funding if they speak up, speak out. And we heard a lot of things that were not said tonight. I also heard a call of action. And my first question was, what are the four key points of this meeting? And why wasn't there a sign-up sheet outside for me to choose to volunteer to be on one of those four committees, starting with the homeless that the three municipalities has started? I'm just hearing about it tonight, so let's take the momentum, sign up on that committee, and start doing something. Uh, another thing is... Um, is there a committee? Is there a coalition? Juno is doing it. God bless Juno, sincerely. I see them on Facebook doing this, that, and the other, and Ketchikan is still, after, let's call it 10 years, now scratching themselves saying, well, maybe we should be doing something. Is there a committee that unifies these people that stood tonight and say, we, the residents, are here to support this. Is there a committee? Is there a coalition? Is that your next goal as council assembly to start doing this? We are going nowhere with the horror stories and the complaints and the accusations unless there is some organization. Now, back to me, me, me. 
What I did here tonight is the readiness to make change. I live on Maine, and we heard last week residents from Grant Street who are saying there needs to be a change because those people out there are not ready for change, and they're using the parking lots, the uh, vacant or, or open areas for restrooms, camping, and such. This homelessness is part of the problem, and they are the ones that are taking advantage of all the government programs. Food, housing, shelters by day, clothing, showers, all of this is great, but the one thing they lack is money. And when they don't have change in their pocket for cigarettes, for alcohol, for drugs, they knock on my car door and steal stuff out of it. They have stolen $3,000 from my apartment, and I'm tired of being a victim of these people who are not ready for change. I'm no longer willing to fund. I am not a federal government in which I'm funding these people. Second of all, great, they've been arrested. Notice how quiet it is on our streets right now. They're all sitting in jail, waiting for their trial to happen. And because they're waiting, when the trial does come to the court, then they're going to be released. They paid, they served their time in jail, and they're gonna get a probation and pay some probation fees and all that sort of stuff and now they're back on the street. So we have a revolving door. And if you're wanting to talk about enforcement, I think that is one of four categories here that we have to address this problem. Main Street, Grant Street, uh, down there by Creek Street, Park Avenue. All you need to do is read the daily news once a week to see where the rests are made and they're constantly of those neighborhoods that gather the homeless. So, point of my story is, call to action here. Who's going to start the first coalition in which Ketchikan catches up with what other cities are doing? And I'll be more than happy to volunteer on one of these four uh, committees that are going to deal with enforcement homelessness, drugs, and rehabilitation. Those are four great starts. So the new mayor of Ketchikan, we look forward to this new city council and assembly to get us organized. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Stevenson? Thank you. Um, Councilman Brzezinski asked if we could hear from local law enforcement, I guess the Ketchikan Police Department folks. I see a couple of you back there, so you want to come on up for a minute or two? Hello, good evening. Good evening. Can I start? Good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess I just want to hear from you guys your take on this. Um, what you think we need? How do you think it's working? You heard from Burrow Dial uh, his idea, what you think about that. I just want to hear what you guys have to say. This is, law enforcement plays a big part in this. Sure. And uh, how can we help you? Well, we currently have one drug investigator. Uh, the state trooper investigator is being transferred here. So that office will be filled here pretty quick uh, in November. So we're excited to have that, and they're actually working together in the in the Ketchikan Police Department. So those two will share an office within the within our building. So uh, being able to share that intelligence, you know, between the state troopers and the the city is it's invaluable. Um, in in regards to Mayor Dial's uh, comment, you know, if if you have an extra drug investigator or two, you're just multiplying their their ability to to flood the city and to, to work more investigations. Uh, I was preparing some information just for the, the year-end budget and um, 
you know, this year we've we've pulled about, I mean, a, a street value. So whatever the, the going rate is for certain types of pills, you know, the, the amount that we've seized this year is about a quarter million dollars um, that, that isn't on the streets. But certainly there's there's more out there. Uh, so if we only have a quarter million seized, how many how many more are really out there that are that are being used? Um, you know, we I think we had some some comment about a, a drug canine, you know, or mechanisms how people import narcotics into town. Uh, and Mayor Dial nailed them all. You know, it's however you can get into catch can. The, the drugs are coming in the same way. Uh, you know, in addition to you know, postal services. Um, FedEx, UPS. So however you can mail it, or if you can walk it on the plane, uh, if you can carry it, they're doing it. So um, there was some mention about therapeutic court, which isn't there. Um, I don't want to speak for, for Mr. Peel, but I know that he had some experience with that, and it's a great success story for him. Uh, I don't know if he's still here or not, but... but uh, you know, whatever we can do, you know, it, we had several retirements this last year. If, if, the, if the expectation is that we fill another drug position, realistically, we're going to have to pull from patrol. You know, we'd have to do those interviews, find the best fit, move that person in. Problem is, is now you have void patrol, so now you're going to have a calls uh, of service that aren't being answered in the community. So it, it takes a while if you buy if, if you. Uh, hire a new officer, you know, with no experience, that they're not going to be valuable to us until, you know, nine months to a year just because of the training and getting them through the academy, getting some experience and getting them on the road. So, um, yeah, I mean, we could, we could use the manpower. We could use the training, you know. Once, once you do have this, you know, drug investigator, they're not, you know, just because you call an investigator doesn't automatically mean that they're out doing that work. You know, there's there's schools, there's classes, there's training that they have to do. There's a DEA basic is what they call it, where uh, the federal government actually comes through and they train. We've had several, I mean, uh, Lieutenant Bernson's one of these uh, DEA trained investigators. Um, Mark Sieverts in the back is, is also one when he was working for KPD that was went through that school. So, you know, that's a two week long school where they gain invaluable uh, training information on how to, to work uh, drug cases, informants, uh, things like that. So you got, you know, it's been, I guess I'll echo the same thing. It's going to cost money. So but we're on board if that's the direction the council wants to go. Currently, how many um, spaces are you short, I mean, in terms of officers? I believe we're th three frozen. Okay. Here. So, um, of course, for disclosure, Mark is my, my son, but uh, you have to interact a lot, I imagine, with uh, when you're talking about mail, passengers, freight, that type of stuff, there's an interaction with uh, not only Seattle, but with the local airport, and we do have a police force at the airport, to say. What are the barriers that a community can play? And Andy may probably knows this, as well as anybody, but uh, what are the barriers that are present that... Yeah, I'll let the lieutenant speak to it. He runs the investigation division and, and works those cases with them, so... Go for it. So, I mean, it kind of takes in a lot of what we talked about tonight in that, that COVID has kind of made this a kind of a criminal's market right now. I mean, when you're talking about case buildup, you're talking about a lack of incarceration, talk about cases being purged that are solid cases against defendants that need that attention. Um, that's one huge barrier. Because uh, once you get to that point, um, a lot of times those, those cases aren't, aren't coming to their full conclusion because of the world we're in right now. A lot of places stopped and, and the world stopped for a lot of people out there. But you know, for us, it actually just got worse in, in, the, in the terms of uh, mental health, uh, depression, drug use. The normal barriers, I would say, uh, for drug enforcement are just access. And, and there's a lot of, um, it's actually more ways than we can get to catch can drugs get here because now one of the predominant roles is internal body carry. And so you're dealing with uh, a, a, a lot more health risks, uh, to they call them mules, people bringing those drugs into town. Uh, there's legal barriers to be able to execute those searches through legal process on 
On those, uh, we require the assistance of mental, sorry, medical professionals a lot of time. Um, they're not always real eager to assist in that area. Uh, judges require a lot of information, so a, a normal case uh, would just require that much more information, and rightfully so, it's a very invasive search. Um, but then you're dealing with private entities that have uh, policies that aren't necessarily law, but they're privacy policies, uh, such as Alaska Airlines, other areas that can decide essentially how much they want to cooperate, or if they're going to cooperate at all. And so these are all barriers, and, and access to these means of, of importation of the drug is, is what we what we lack the most, and then back to um, what uh, Acting Chief Matson said is 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 time. I mean, our biggest asset is our people and the and the hours that we can put in. And unfortunately, of course, that's the biggest financial uh, burden that the city is looking at. I mean, we've effectively been down. We have four vacancies right now. We have two at the academy. We have one on long-term disability. We spent the summer with two more on long-term disability. We've effectively been down eight bodies quarter of our staff, or a third of our staff, for a, a significant amount of time. Not saying that's the reason that these issues are, are among us right now, but they're certainly not helping. And we need the people and the hours to put out there in the community to get these resources, to get the intelligence, to have the community work for us, which is what you need in drug enforcement. You need to develop assets within the community. I had a conversation today. Someone comes up to me in this room and says, hey, this is going on right next to my house. That's extremely valuable information and, and we need that because we can't be out there sneaking around people know us to recognize us and so we need the community essentially to work for us this isn't a shame tactic it's just the reality of it is our guys need to be out there having the time to develop those relationships that will help us get these things out the streets and it, Eric mentioned a lot of statistics that was probably a down year for us just because we've had uh, half of the year pretty much without a dedicated <coughs> drug officer as our previous one was transitioning into retirement. And so it's kind of been a hodgepodge year of training a new guy and a lot of us just kind of chipping in when we could to make drug cases. A normal year would be a lot more than what you're going to see when you look at the budget. So, so, I'm sorry. If I may, so I, you know, we have BPSOs, we have the borough, we have the state troopers, and we have the city. And we have what sounds like a considerable problem in um, stemming the, the flow of uh, illegal drugs into the community. And so, um, and of course, we have a perfect storm in regards to personnel loss and retirement and illnesses and, and the lack of the ability to attract police officers. Um, and this is this is a community issue. Um, it's really based, uh, unfortunately, some of it is all on the funding and dollars in the economy. We got to find a way to find that money, and, and we got to rely on the state and the federal government to help out some of these communities that have had, I think, uh, a more severe impact from an economic downturn than others, because it's going to take us a while to recover from that. But that shouldn't stop us from providing the needed services and the right amount of staffing to address the problem. So I appreciate your, your guys' comments tonight. And I think it's good for the public to know that um, if you want to really address this issue, it's going to cost some money someplace to somebody. And uh, it takes manpower to, to fix it. So thank you, Andy, for what you guys are doing. And I know that you guys have been working short staff. And I thank you for your efforts through that process, and I'm sure the mayor and the next council will, will be looking at that as they, as they review the budgets, and um, we'll try to find ways to help you, so thank well, you. I hate to do it, Bob. I'll contradict you just a, a tad. Um, we, have, we have a great group now, and for the first time yeah. since I've been here, we got people banging on the door to get in. So we, we have some solid applicants that are just waiting for us to tell them there's jobs out there, so that's a good thing. That is a good thing. We've got a good foundation of who we have right now. I'm really happy with who we have uh, moving forward. Uh, we just need just need a few more. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Z. I, I want to thank you guys. I think as a city uh, and as a council, uh, we haven't given you guys the attention or the support that you deserve. And um, I think that we need to make 
law enforcement a priority. I think we need to fund you the way you need to be funded. And uh, I just want to say I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Thank you. Mr. Gass. Well, just kind of echo Judy, but, uh, you know, it, like she said, there's, everybody sees the problem, but, you know, all you got to do is pick up the newspaper and see, it's pretty amazing the busts that these guys do do on a routine basis, so I also want to just give them a, a kudos. I think uh, a very important piece of this pie is, uh, in the prevention, is enforcement, and, uh, you know, I don't care what people say, if people know they're going to go to prison for years on end, it's going to help keep them from doing that. So yeah, kudos to the law enforcement. Okay, that takes care of, um, Mr. Timmerman, you wanna come up? <laughs> well, no, no. <laughs> I know you scheduled this on Dodger game night. <laughs> yes, I did. They won, by the way. They did. Two to one. I always spoil all your fun, Mr. Uh, I want to thank you guys for doing this. Dave, for really taking a stand and actually doing this, you know, and the rest of you too. And I want to thank you for putting up with me. I've had the gas on the pedal on all you guys over the last several weeks, all the way down to that chintzy one-inch ad you guys had on page seven of the sports section for this meeting. I mean, let's do a little better in that regard when we're going to do stuff like this. Um, fund the police. God, fund the police. They do have good guys there. I wish Matson was in for chief. He'd be a great chief, but he also likes what he's doing. Um, I actually made some notes during this. I wasn't gonna talk, believe it or not. Um, I know that's laughter, but I'm gonna change that to something worse now. I, I get really triggered when I come here because the first house I pass, in fact, when you guys leave here, I want you to, to look at the very last house at the bottom of Venetia Way on the right-hand side, okay? I want you guys to look at that house. That's where my best friend's son shot himself a couple years ago. So when I come here before a meeting, that's my first trigger. You know, I also drove by Creek Street where Brandon Larson went in that creek. You know, nobody gets in that creek on purpose unless they're messed up in the mind, right? Chased by gunpoint, chased by gunpoint, okay? I'm throwing that in there. I have 17 people on my phone this evening that really wanted to participate in this, but they're scared to death of the people in this room. They're scared to death of us. They're scared to death of you, Mr. Dial. They're scared to death of you guys because of the stigma. There's some great people doing great things. Stomp the stigma, the Wellness Coalition, all this stuff is fantastic. But it's definitely not combined. Everybody's doing a different thing to chase the same goal. There does need to be some sort of umbrella over this to bring it all back together. It, it's, it's got to. I, I gotta refer to my notes before I go too far. Coast Guard, Coast Guard should be here. We are a Coast Guard town. For a long time, Coast Guard did not do drug interdictions. I know that, I was a harbor master. That wasn't their job here. They've shifted that a little bit. Uh, fishing has gone down. I've talked to the base commander. Um, they also did a bust in Thomas Basin, 128 something grams of meth. It was like a quarter pound of meth, people. That guy got out of jail just a couple days later because of COVID. Good thing the harbor master kicked him out of the harbor. He didn't have a place to be, so he went back to Wrangell, hopefully, if he was allowed to. Uh, Andy hit a bunch of it. The courts are letting people out. There's not enough of a system in place to catch this. They're doing the bus. They aren't the ones letting people go. They aren't the ones letting people go. Dave, you work at the jail. You gotta get them to allow them to do suboxone and things like that in the jail. You have a voice just from being there and being the mayor of Ketchikan now. And uh, I'm rambling a lot right here because I'm excited that this is even going on and, and it's kind of a culmination of a lot of stuff. And uh, you know, I've been to the borough um, you guys have access to legislation. You guys can talk at the state level. You can break through some of those Medicaid barriers. You do have cops at the airport and they do have powers and those powers are to bust people. 
I'm sick of hearing the we don't have law enforcement capabilities, but we have airport powers. I don't know what that means. You guys got to cooperate with them too. The cops said it. I got a meeting with the new drug investigator for the troopers. He'll be here in 19 days. I'm glad to hear that they share an office. I'm glad that you guys got the cops up here to talk. That's fantastic. Um, we need a detox center. There's no doubt. Um, and a lot of people get up here and say, nobody's going to get well until they're ready. I get that. You're an addict. You're not going to get better until you're ready. You can't. And even then it's hard. Sometimes it never happens. But we need to be ready to stop that before it happens. We live on a damn island in Alaska. I get it. We have an understaffed police force. We have a bunch of groups that are doing things to help, but none of it's cohesive. Let's get a drug dog that goes through AML stuff. Let's get a drug dog that meets the UPS plane. Let's do that. You know, yeah, that's another dollar amount, but man, the amount of money we're spending on recovery and homelessness and substance abuse and all that, you're going to gain that back in spades if you just do it ahead of time. We're being reactive, not even proactive. I'm hoping that this is the start of something, but I'll tell you what, when there was two suicides on my crew in 2009, we all got together in this room. There was about 700 of us, I think was the count. It was amazing. And parents stood up here and asked, how come we know the dealers and nobody's done anything about it? I asked the same thing to the cops in this room right now. The same people we were talking about then are still dealing now. I won't drop his name, but you know who I'm talking about, Andy. It's the same guy. It's huge. You guys know who I'm talking about, too. And if you don't, I'm, I'm amazed. Suicides, ugh, it's just amazing. You heard from somebody today that there's been 13 overdose deaths in this town in the last seven months, eight months, nine months, whatever. Does that amaze you guys? That's stuff that should be brought to your table on a regular basis. That's stuff that you should be gleaning that information from the community and be ready to deal with that. I know I'm rambling up here. I'm sorry for that. Um... I'm just glad you guys are doing this. There's two types of dealers, okay? There's the dealer that blows into town and wants to make a lot of money and has been doing it. And there's the dealer that has to sell to use. And almost everybody that I know that's an addict has to do that hustle. They've got to get that gram to get that tenth, to get to sell those other tenths, to get that, to get that, so they can get high. Those aren't the people we should be busting. I get that. I'm not about that. But let's bust the big dealers. Let's bust the guys that we know are dealing. Let's do that. You know, it's time. It's really time, guys. Especially for that one guy I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about. You don't have to. The cops do. They do. We stood up and we gave his name here nine years ago. Anyway, hit me on Facebook. I'll give you. Anybody who wants to know, hit me up. Anyway, thanks, you guys. That's okay. Congratulations, Dave. Good. Okay. If you're going to talk, could you please come to the microphone? Because that way, that way, that way. We can. Yes, please. So I'm Angela Blandoff, and then I can leave. And I have grown up in this community. I'm a former foster child. I'm also an adoptive mom. My dad also, Clark Faulkner, was a Vietnam vet in this community, and also at times was up there at the jail. And we all know, and we've discussed it, and that is up at the jail, there's no mental health services. There is no drug and alcohol assessments done in the jail. That needs to be assessed. We do definitely need a detox center. People are left and right, as this gentleman has just said, and that is we've lost so many people in this community. Yes, there's a homelessness problem, but no one is dealing with and discussing the cultural trauma. And I'm talking about generations now of cultural trauma that's affecting our community here. And I wasn't here before. I think I got here at 7, maybe I missed that.
but there was generations now of cultural trauma that has affected this community, directly affected me, my families, and my people. And I mean all people in this community, white, black, native people. It killed me about Brandon. It's killing this entire community. People, I just saw a gentleman just days ago, flat out unconscious on the street and people walk past him. We walk past these people every day. And I get it, just like the other gentleman has said, it's not, and he stated they need a home, but we're missing cultural trauma. We're missing and not discussing post-traumatic stress syndrome. We're not discussing how these people became addicts. The other person mentioned they start doing drugs, alcohol. We're not discussing sexual trauma. We're not discussing domestic violence. Thank you, Lord, that we have wish. Not only do we need more education, but those things also need to be on the table. We can't just say, well, you're an addict, remove the drug, bust them on the drugs, put them in jail, and imprison them. Punishing them for just drugs does not fix the problem. You can't just take away the drug. Sometimes people do get a script and then therefore they do become addicted. Putting them in jail even for small quantities, why did they do it to begin with? One example, I've waited now 18 years for my brother. 18 years I, I waited and he's now two years sober because of trauma. I got blessed and an amazing foster mom, Gigi Pilcher. She's been in my life since I was 17 years old, and this year I turned 51. But my siblings weren't so lucky. One started out doing drugs at nine years old, popping pills. He was handed them due to his trauma from a person here in this community from a business, and he stuck. My other brother, though, was institutionalized because it started out in small amounts and kept going back to jail. No mental health assessments. And he had to keep going back and being punished, coming back out. And then he couldn't get a job because he was a felon. Kept going back. But no one did a PTSD assessment, no mental health assessment. But see, you know what? I love him unconditionally. And it paid off. And he's sober. But I did lose a spouse behind Woodside, September 26, 2001. He was an alcoholic, Alaska Native, from cultural boarding school trauma. Now, if no one has seen the news on how much cultural trauma that there has been, let alone in the state of Alaska. And we live in, we live in Ketchikan. This is Ketchikan and Saxman and all the other surrounding islands. You all need to wake up here on PTSD, sexual abuse, domestic violence, on how much all of those things affect drug and alcohol abuse. It, there's layers here. You can't just, you can't, it's not just about the drugs. It's bigger than that. And you can't just punish them. Then there's the court systems that when they get these people before the judges, they say horrible, mean things about these people that come before their court. Yes, I understand that they just see their case files, but they're human people. And we all need to not forget those people on the streets. They have a mom. They have a dad. They're someone's brother. There's someone's sister, and there's someone's child. So even though you all are talking about housing, and you're talking about money, and you're talking every, well, they need to keep going to prison. They're still our families. This is our community that we grew up in. So no matter what the situation is or how they act, and yes, I agree that if they break the law, they should be accountable. But don't just punish them and write them off. Because you know what, just like this one gentleman, that young lady is sober and she's alive because once they're dead, they're gone. And the trauma then to their children and their families, it's more trauma. This community in Saxman 
all of those people that are addicts is trauma. And I can almost guarantee you the majority of them is trauma. So it's bigger than that, just the drug. And then the cops who bust the big dealers, they may be busting, that's great, the large quantity of drugs, but they also wire those people, those other addicts, right? They wire them and they set them up. And then they give them less time to go back out, but they don't care about those people in our community. I know, because I know the people that they set up. So it doesn't stop our community from doing the drugs. You may get the big people and the drugs off the street, but our people in this community are hurting. We need Gateway more accountable. They're changing people and staff every three months. Okay, that infrastructure needs to change. Reentry obviously needs more money, so the people coming out of jail, they have a place to stay and more support. Need more um, resources and, and counseling services here. But there also needs to be more awareness of what PTSD is, cultural trauma is, domestic violence is, you know, all of it. So anyway, I'm sorry I get really intense here, but these are human people. Please, when you see these people, be kind. Ask them who they are. Don't walk past them. And I see that a lot. I see them at Safeway, but I still, I don't know their story but they have one. So please just see that. It's not just a number, getting housing or whatever. See who they are because this is the town that we lived in and this town saved my life. And by doing so, I then therefore saved others and I continue, will continue in this town doing that. So I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Only a moment here, uh, Stephen Bradford, and I also want to acknowledge that Keenan Sanderson is here. He and I are newly elected school board members, and I think we're the only uh, representatives of the school district that are here tonight, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, we've heard a lot of references to children and how it starts at age 11, and uh, Mayor Dial mentioned how the school resource officer can be a benefit uh, uh, when it's properly funded and active in our schools and we've heard about PTSD and the impact it has on children and, and their path towards addiction. And I just want to encourage you all that as this discussion and conversation continues and as we set up round tables and such, that you reach out to the school district and our administration and our um, professional staff that should have been here tonight um, and to provide some input but also to receive information that has been shared tonight. It's been very helpful. And I think uh, Keenan and I would both like to go back to our, once we're sworn in, and actually have something to talk about um, uh, as part of this uh, round table and this communication and discussion. So thank you for putting this on tonight. Okay, that takes care of a comment, public comment. That will be moving, we'll move into the new business item. Well, we've uh, heard an awful lot of information tonight. What do you guys think? Yeah. Go ahead. So given the information that we received tonight and uh, discussions that have been had, I would suggest that uh, probably a meeting of the mayors to, uh, so for you to reach out to the other mayors to start to form either a task force or a coalition or whatever you may want to, call it regarding um, the opioid uh, issue that we heard here tonight. And uh, we should have a list of those individuals that spoke tonight, but I think that list would probably be broadened as uh, Mr. Bradford had talked to you about in regards to like the school district and other places. Um, and I think that the intent would be to find a path forward, take that first bite at the apple, whatever it is, for an action item that we can 
actually maybe achieve and, and, and identify some of those things that we have to work on as a community and as individual bodies um, moving forward. So um, that I guess under the new business discussion, um, that would be my suggestion. So um, I don't know if you want to ask for four hands or however you want to handle that. Let's, let's, let's go around, then we'll get back to that. Okay. Ms. Gage. Um. First of all, um, Duckworth's here. There is a coalition, the, the Substance Abuse Task Force, and I think if, if um, instead of reinventing the wheel, if you bring that group in, plus add in the mayors and uh, school board members and the um, Saxman um, Council, if they even have one, a couple people appointed to that, I think you could actually get a little, at least a head start, instead of re, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel. Um, I don't know if Duckworth wants to speak. <laughs> she looks, she looks a little anxious over there. But um, we have, uh, I think, um, even people from the. I haven't been to a meeting in a while, so forgive me, but I'll let her go for me. Thanks, Janelle. Oh, is this on? I don't think it's on. My well, light's on, but. Hello? OK. I wasn't planning on speaking. I was planning on listening to what everyone had to say. Um, Daniel Duckworth, uh, and first and foremost, I'm a member of recovery. Um, just a little clarification, Stop the Stigma isn't a task force or a coalition. Um, I literally was just a person in recovery that wanted to do something that didn't require this right here. And uh, I appreciate this, and I think this is needed. Um, but I wanted to do something. So I got some people together in recovery and said, let's do a march. And I went to Judy, Judy Zingy and said, can we end the march in your parking lot? And it took one person to not judge me or stigmatize me or say, I don't want that. I don't need to deal with that in the mall. I don't need your kind in here messing things up or whatever it is that happens. And that also at the time, my boss was a big advocate for what I was doing, and I was scared to death to come out and talk about my drug addiction because I was only a year sober at the time. And um, what would my job think? What would the community think about where I work? And he said to me, there's nothing that your present couldn't argue about your past. And because of those words and one person who believed in me, I was able to stand up and do some stuff. And I didn't do any of that alone. Um, I think that... There does need to be big things at this level, but all that kept going through my mind is like, where's all the people in recovery? Where's all the people who tried to navigate the system when they were 22 hours off heroin? Where are the people who walked in a gateway with a bottle of vodka in their backpack trying to fill out a packet this huge on how to get themselves some help? Um, I took an hour-long car ride today with a 19-year-old girl whose family called me and said, we don't know what to do with her, she needs help. And I always say, I'm not a professional. I don't know, like, I have no degrees, but I know that there's meetings every single night in Ketchikan at 8 o'clock, and that is a instant, free place that you can go where people who understand what you're going through can be there to help you, and that is always my first, uh, first go-to. Um, people, I think, I wasn't here for the beginning, people had a lot to say about what we don't have in Ketchikan, but I know seven years ago when I came into, when I started to get sober, I walked into Aquila and they said it was going to be like two months before I could get an assessment. And I walked this young lady in today and they said we could probably have an assessment in a week. So there's a lot of finger pointing going on about what we don't have and what's not happening in Ketchikan, but big strides have been made. So I think it's important to look at that also. Um, so I appreciate that. I would love to be part of this conversation and to see what else we can do in Ketchikan because it's, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Everyone knows that we uh, have a problem. So, and there's also not one solution. Not just you guys can fix it. Not just KIC can fix it. Not just Gateway can fix it. Not just the school district can fix it. It's going to be all of us. And it's not going to be this year or even this decade probably. But if we keep having the conversation, maybe my kids' kids will have a better start. So uh, I appreciate the conversation being started and would love to know when more conversations are being had. Thanks. Thank you. Back to the council members. Mr. Flora. Thank you. 
So there's a social service aspect, there's a law enforcement aspect, there's always a funding component to anything we do. Um, it's a lot to take in tonight. A uh, couple of thoughts. Fentanyl, fentanyl, fentanyl came up repeatedly tonight. How easy it is to get easier than heroin. Um, I'm not a law enforcement expert like Mr. Dial, but it seems to me one component of this problem is accessibility. And I think it's a rational idea to consider that since we've had this conversation at the local level, it's, it's a local problem, it's a worldwide problem. We, we heard a lot of different opinions about that tonight. You know, we have, a, we have a, a, two senators and we have a congressman. And the further we keep fentanyl from our town, the better it is for our town. It's not a Republican issue, it's not a Democratic issue. The flow of fentanyl into our country this year over our southern border is up by 400% year over year. The further we keep it away from our town, I would have to think, the better it is for our town. If I'm wrong, then I would like a law enforcement expert to tell me that I'm wrong. Um, I would like to see four hands um, to ask the city manager to go back to the draft budget that they haven't presented yet because she doesn't have enough to do. And I'd like to see the three frozen police positions funded this budget cycle. So I'd like to see if there's four hands to, for support to have the manager give us the nuts and bolts of that at the next, uh, or at the next, next budget cycle when that starts. Um, there's a lot of work to do on this if there is a role that the city can assist in. Um, I think one other thing, I was pretty happy to hear that the um, hospital is considering a detox and I would like to learn more about that. So could somebody reach out to Dory and see where they are at with that? And I don't know if the city is a player in that. I, I know we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money for everything. We just had a Ports and Harbors meeting the other night. The Port Fund might be insolvent before the beginning of the next season, or it might not. We'll see, we'll get there. Um, we have a very talented staff and they always find a way to get us through but we're not gonna have enough money to do all of the things we want. So I think it's more important than ever to pick and choose where we put our money. Ms. Sengi. So what I think we should do is rely on the people that we fund, um, the Wellness Coalition, folks like that, I think those are the people to lead this. I'd like to see this put together similar to how we put our other committees together where we have people from the borough, people from the city, a couple of members sitting on a committee and reporting back to us and have them tell us in a perfect world what they need. They're not gonna get everything, I gather that, but I don't know that having these conversations, I just remember when we had the homeless, when we had that, this room was packed. There was a couple hundred people at least, and four women who, were, who didn't have a chance to speak that night were in a corner putting together the first city day shelter. And I think it's the people that are on the ground, boots on the ground, um, that are going to complete this for us and work on this. And I would suggest that we look to, I'm gonna say the Wellness Coalition because they sort of encompass all these other nonprofits. At least they did, I think they still do. They're all under that umbrella. Um, and I think they're the folks to take this on. I don't think it's, I don't think any of us at this table um, really know what's going on. I kind of agree with Ms. Duckworth. I mean, they need to reach out to the people who are going through this um, and see what's successful and what's not. That's my two cents. Anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Hey, yeah, just really as a young person. Well, I personally found this meeting 
educational for me. I can personally say I learned a lot, and uh, maybe that's a diss on me. I should have known more, but I, I think that goes to show that having the conversation is helpful. And there's so many different uh, pieces to this pie, um, but I think Judy had a fair point just now, which is that there are, as we've said, there are organizations, there are nonprofits, many of which we, the city, fund. And uh, so I think starting at square one would be, you know, making sure that the, the connections are made and, and the groups are talking to each other so we can get the best bang for our buck. Um, certainly, as Mr. Flora likes to point out, every meeting uh, funding is always an issue. So thankfully, the budget is just around the corner. So I think if we have this on our minds as we're going through the budget, uh, as we decide what, what we do and don't want to do on this issue, that's the time to do it, is at the time of the budget. So I think this was a good timing for that. And as First Mayor Dial and the KPD have brought up, the other big piece to the puzzle, I believe, is the law enforcement. Um, again, ties right into the budget, but I, I agree we ought to look at maybe beefing up our uh, KPD a little bit. I can only imagine uh, how much worse the problem would be if KPD wasn't making busts like they do all the time. So, yeah, a lot to take in, but I appreciate this meeting happening, and uh, I found it very educational. Okay, a couple, couple of things. Um, yeah, we're not the experts. We're not the ones to probably try to do these things. The groups on the ground that actually work in this, in, in this situation have a lot better uh, grasp of it. That said, there are a couple, I, I heard at least two things that are probably outside the purview of almost all the groups working in this. I mean, really. Housing and detox. Um, those are areas we're probably going to have to, you know, government, sorry, is going to probably figure out some way to at least help those processes along. Um, I liked what um, Mayor Bob said, except that when he used the words task force, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we've all heard, I mean, as, as much as I like the idea of forming a group to deal with this, I've formed and been, been, been personally formed onto so many of those groups in the past. You know, I'd rather see some semblance of action now rather than just say, well, we're going to have a group, it's going to meet for the next six months, then it'll come back to us, and by then we'll be on, on some other topic. Um, so if there's any possible way to look at certain areas, um, certainly whatever we can do to help the hospital uh, move ahead with the detox center. Now, I have heard from other people in, in the industry saying that the, you know, the, the, the bricks and mortar detox facility may not be the, the most effective thing. I still think the fact we don't have one in this community is part of the problem. And I think that's, that's something. And certainly if the borough is looking at housing, I'm all for doing whatever we can to help that process because that's, that, that, that's, that's even beyond this, in, this in discussion tonight. The entire community right now is suffering from, from a lack of affordable housing at this point. And we need to be looking at that as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree we probably need to look at, uh, at ways to give, give the uh, police department more, uh, more tools, but... Uh, as, as, as we're often told in other, other areas, it's got to be within the context of the entire budget. It's got to be, we, you can't just say, let's fully fund this. Because when we do that in the current financial situation we're in, then the question is, okay, what don't you fund? You know, and if we leap to immediately fill those positions there, as we found in the past, that's going to have an opportunity cost somewhere else. So... Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, um, Vice Mayor Count uh, Kuyper. I, I agree with Judy that the, the city, the borough or whatever, aren't the ones that probably should be the ultimate driver, uh, but they are a participant. And as to Mayor uh, Kuyper's credit, you know, we got this group together tonight and everybody saw the value in the discussion. And I think the city as a leader in the community, has the ability to draw these people together. Once that group is together, the formation of it and the leadership can, can come out of that meeting. 
because everybody has a certain part to play in this. And like you said, uh, when it comes to the enforcement part, city has police powers. That's going to be something the city is going to have to draw on. The borough is doing housing studies and has housing issues. We all have a certain part of this. And, uh, but I think that there's further meetings that need to be had because we need to define what the housing for transitional housing really does look like. Uh, and, and maybe even what's what's available. And then uh, we we have to talk about the detox center and how that all runs between all the different uh, disciplines in the in the organization, how they get their referrals and and uh, stuff like that. And then they, they talked about having treatment in the correction facility, how that all works out. And the schools, the education part of it is huge. So uh, there's a lot of things to be brought forward. And all I was suggesting is that as the leader that brought this group together, that we should bring that or, or start to form that coalition. And I don't think it should be staff. Staff already has enough to do in regards to getting the budget ready and, and managing shorthanded as they are. So it's the policy makers, I think, that has to take the, the first leadership on this. And then <clears throat> once that group's formed, they can decide how it's, how the makeup is of it, I, I would think. The coalition, or, uh, Maybe the organization that runs, that's fine. I, I don't think that there's any objection to that. Go ahead, Ms. Bradbury. All right, so um, I, like <coughs> Riley, uh, learned a lot through this meeting about services that I didn't know it was, didn't know were available. And the whole time I'm sitting here wondering, do people who want to recover, who are ready, do they even know these services exist? Um, Ketchikan Wellness Coalition, they listed off five or six things that um, they would like to see or need um, partnerships through. And one of them or two of them really stood out as tonight we could say, yes, we could support and we can move forward on that. And that is um, helping them with marketing of the campaign for um, destigmatizing, you know, addicts and what they're going through. We have a large gathering through Facebook, um, we also have other avenues of TV commercials or maybe working with radios. We have uh, radio stations to create PSAs. We have access to that. We have a media team that does phenomenal things. I mean, look at everything they put forth. Let's try to utilize them more and kind of partner more with them and get this information out, as well as what services are available. Um, constantly updating those type of things. Um, and then, uh, she had mentioned signage on city properties. I'd be curious to see what was her thought and ideas um, on that. I know they did, was it a couple years now? I think pre-COVID they did the signs, uh, the motivational signs, and put them throughout uh, the community. People did or businesses did. That would be awesome to really put that on a larger scale or advertise services in places that these people might congregate a little bit more on public property and really start making it known what is available for them so that when they are ready, they, they have access to that and they don't necessarily even have to go ask somebody because they might feel uncomfortable doing that. They can see it, it's posted everywhere. Um, and I think that's something that we as a city could you know, have staff kind of move forward with right now that doesn't necessarily have to go through a budget cycle to find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to support that. Um, so that's the first thing. The Also Narcan, we can support that. Um, we have a ton of facilities throughout this community. Uh, we, the borough also has tons of facilities. Let's start setting those places up, making those safe zone. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work because as people have mentioned, they're scared to get up here and talk. Um, I was once there when I was on the other side. I get it. Um, so we really need to continue to break down that wall. It will take some time, but we need to keep doing that. And maybe having these stations available can help get us there and open at least the door. Um, I do agree with other comments about the police department. Um, drugs are readily available. I have somebody down the street that constantly has people there day and night getting drugs, we've had three overdoses this year, um, or two in that area from that house. Um, police have been there before, they're frequented there, they're still doing all these behaviors. Um, and so it is frustrating, but I do understand that they don't have bodies. 
I mean, we want them to work on the homeless issue. We want them to work on this issue. We want them to still patrol the streets um, and do all these other things, but yet we aren't willing to give them any manpower to get to that point. So I definitely think we need to get back to the drawing board on how, through our financial struggle, how can we support them, even with one more body that's better than none. Um, and so those are just a few things that kind of have stood out to me that we as a council could do right now on our own versus needing to have the professionals lead us into a more dedicated policy session. So. Ms. Sengi. So did we do the four hands on Mark? No, I was just going to. Going oh, to okay. <laughs> so we had a couple of requests for four hands. Um, one, was from, one was from Mayor Sievertson. Do, we want to, do you want to go ahead and ask for that? Excuse me. We need to reach out and get uh, a meeting with those interested parties out here tonight to start to form a coalition to deal with this. Just don't call it a task force. Okay. Got it. Okay. So do we have four hands for that? Uh... You can't vote, can you? I can't. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Oh, you're voting. That's I'm right. voting. I'm voting. We, we can't both vote. <laughs> The, 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 the clerks will come get us. Yeah. So, okay, that, that. And then uh, there was a request for four hands for the. It was four hands for the information added back to the budget cycle that's coming up. Oh, and by the way, Council Member Gass, you should never say that you're looking forward to the next budget cycle. There's something very wrong about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was He'll the information. And I want to speak to a couple of comments you made. Council Member Zingy's right. A lot of the topics that came up tonight are not on our wheelhouse. Leave those to the experts. The mayor is right. The city has police powers. You're right. There's urgency and immediacy that we need to deal with here, or we're going to be talking about it in six months going, what did we do? I'm only asking for this to be considered at the next budget cycle. It certainly doesn't have to be approved. It's within our wheelhouse as policymakers, and it's something that we can do in the next budget cycle. And if this community decides it's important enough, we'll hear from those folks saying, do this. And if they think it's the wrong direction to go, then by all means, they should speak up and let us know. And hopefully it'll be better than a 17% voter turnout. Okay? That's why I'm asking for the four hands. I know the money's going to have to come from somewhere. We're down to picking and choosing what we think, with input from our peers in the community, what's the best direction to go. That's the only reason why I'm asking for the, the, the early budget presentation to be augmented with that information. Okay, four hands. Sorry, Lindsay. Um, did you have a? No, no, no. no I was, I was, did you did you did you want to suggest that we we take those steps that you suggested in terms of using our our our, our immense public relations powers to? Can you not add new agenda items tonight? No, you, you, you can, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to bring have um, maybe staff talking to the mic. Sorry. Uh, maybe I guess it would be four hands or. Uh, we could discuss it at the next meeting um, to kind of have um, some of the KPU marketing folks maybe just put a very thin guideline together of what, what services they could offer and the value of that. And then maybe the council can look at that and see um, what, what we would be willing to, to partner with and maybe even contact uh, Amanda on specifically what she was, uh, specific items that she was looking for. Helping. Four hands. May I have a comment? Sure. Oh, sorry. Too late. So, um, <laughs> hopefully, through the, the coalition operation, they will be able to define what the need is, because I think we're looking at it backwards. Because uh, the KPU telecommunication already has a job, and we have to figure out how we fit that in and what the cost is going to be to to do that. So I think that you have to define the need from the groups that are requesting it first 
um, because we don't know how many time slots, how long, if it's a full presentation. I mean, and it may be all of those, and we may be able to um, accommodate all of those, but I think that we, we need a better understanding of what we're, what we're looking at. Go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, if I could just mention a few things about the topic of engaging the KPU marketing team for um, some sort of campaign on this topic. Um, Mayor Siebertson did mention that KPU marketing does have a job, and I'd just like to point out that KPU marketing is funded by KPU, not the general fund. I believe that this type of action would require general fund funding. So I agree that we should engage some of the folks that we heard tonight to develop a proposal that has a cost associated with it. Uh, KPU marketing does not do this type of marketing work for the community as a service. Their sole job is to market the services uh, that KPU offers. So I'm happy to do that with our staff and to work with the community agencies to figure out what that proposal, what that scope of services looks like and its associated cost. Yes, go ahead. Um, well, maybe they could look at, um, I know recently they did a show, a round table uh, with the Stomp the Stigma where they were discussing that. Uh, maybe they, Maybe that's how they do it. Maybe it's not marketing. Maybe it's having a bi-weekly, monthly meeting, um, discussing that, telling people how we're doing, showing people in recovery. I mean, this is a serious issue. We have the resources, and you know, maybe we bump a couple of other shows. I mean, this is important, and we have to make it important. And I think that our voice speaks volumes, and we need to stick by that. That's all I could say. Yes. I guess I, I understand I understand everybody's point of view. I just look at somebody who does marketing campaign um, on a much larger scale than just in town or just for catch can. Even just putting stuff out on Facebook, just a, a post, like a picture or just quick statements. I mean, it might take the initial time, you know, an hour or two to upload three months worth of. Um, content and that's something you can upload it and then you don't even have to think about it um, I I personally think it's worth um, putting that information out letting people use another platform to find other services um, we can't just keep saying well it's not necessarily in our wheelhouse or um, I understand there's a cost associated to it but we need to work a little bit quicker than what we normally work on and I feel like this is something that is so simple that we could activate now versus waiting until we have the mayors meet and then they create a group and then that group meets, which we're running into the holidays. So then that will be after the first of the year and uh, people struggle through the holidays. And so it's just now that timeline is just getting further and further away just for a basic Facebook post. Um, and so that's what I guess I'm just struggling with that on my marketing background that we could easily create something like that that just makes sure people knows the services are available and that there's people in this community willing to help. One of the things that we, I'll go first and I'll let you go. One of the things that uh, was I think frustrating to a lot of us was the, the, the way the narrative was going in the community the last few months is that nothing was being done. That there were no groups doing, take, taking well, this on. Um, and tonight we heard that's not true. And whatever we can do at this point immediately to start getting, as Councilmember Bradbury said, that information out to the public is crucial. I heard from a lot of people in the community who had no idea that a lot of these groups were doing things. And so whatever we can do, and, and yes, I understand we have the, the whole KPU city separation, which you know, is another one of those weird things that every so often leaps out at me, and I, I keep going, ah. I, I, because, because it frustrates the ability to do something. And we have to be careful that we don't completely neuter ourselves by saying, well, we can't do X or Y. And it doesn't have to be a huge um, you know, official campaign. I think it needs to be, we heard just simply putting up signs might help. We heard that being on Facebook would help. That's, these, these are things that shouldn't cost, you know, that, that shouldn't take the council, you know, you know, 14 resolutions and 16 budget amendments and whatever else it always takes us to do anything. So. Two quick points on the issue that 
we're now going around on, I, it seems to me the most simplest solution would be use that very talented expertise uh, marketing group that we have at KPU and fund however many man hours and whatever expenses goes into that would come from the general fund. I would assume it would be something that could be fairly minimal. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that seems like a clear solution. Um, and then I would like to go back to something that Council Member Bradbury said a few minutes ago with as far as, you know, things we can do that are going to make an impact that are, and, and this would be a very small cost thing. Uh, I would like to see some signs, three come to mind right now. If we could make three signs that list all of these entities with these, th these different entities who spoke tonight with phone numbers and a quick description on their services. Again, this was her idea, but I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, if we could put them at the city-owned place that is currently fenced off but soon won't be right next to the new warming shelter. I drive down that road every morning on my way to work and back. I can tell you the people who we are trying to reach, who we are not going to reach at City Hall or in this room, will see it at that location. I guarantee it. Another place that might reach those folks that I believe is part of the port, so would be within our jurisdiction to put up a sign, would be the uh, area behind Sockeye Sands, the covered area, a little sign in there, and then maybe we could reach out to the borough to put one in the bus, the borough bus stop at the mall. I think that could be very cost effective and it would get, like she said, you don't, nobody has to have stigma and all that, nobody even has to, nobody has to know, but people will see that and they can take the number down and they can think about it and, and it's, then all of a sudden it's there. I think that would be a very, uh, something that would be really worthwhile and cheap. So I don't know if we want to put that as a future agenda item or we can think about it, but it was just an idea that seems like a good one to me. Councilmember Gage. Uh, I believe Romanda, even though we couldn't, the mask kind of hid some of that. I believe she already has um, marketing materials she wants to get out. So with that said, more than likely, she also has grant funding to pay for it. So <laughs> um, a lot of these uh, organizations, they get this little bit of a media bust that they can use to pay for these kinds of um, prevention ads. They're, they're separate monies they can only use for some things like that. Um, just getting the okay from us. The, um, I like the idea of how um, putting up the signs, um, especially since a majority of the people we're trying to reach um, don't have internet because almost every single one of these entities is online. The Wellness Coalition has on their website an entire listing of every organization in this community and what they do. Phone numbers, emails, and a play-by-play. -play. Um, one of the, the things I find fascinating, uh, being that I've worked, I was the ASAP um, provider in this community for five years, and um, I also ended up uh, doing somewhat of the, uh, had a few people that were in the um, uh, court for the special, though <laughs> I kept my, it's getting late. Um, <laughs> And one thing I do know is when somebody is actually listening to a person, and this, this is not just on me as a council person. This is, not on every, this is not on just every person sitting at this table, the borough table or the city or the school board. This is every single individual in this community. And I don't care if people get mad at me or not. I have spent a majority of my life sitting with people, meeting them where they are at in some of the worst case scenarios. And no, I don't think jail is the end all. I don't believe that anyone, you, can, you, you can't rotate people through jail. You just can't. And as Blandoff said, there's a lot of trauma underneath all that substance. But there's a person under there at the very bottom trying to get out and screaming to get out. 
And at the bottom of that, there's a lot of people pushing down. And uh, one thing I will agree when it comes to law enforcement, and one thing that I wish, and I know a lot of our officers and a lot of people wish they never did, is pull the ASAP, JSAP program. Um, and the, um, the program that for higher level um, assisting people. Basically, we were the guys that, like, we didn't meet you where you were at. We sat you down, we worked with you until, at, at whatever level you were at. And we, wait, <laughs> we, in a lot of ways, sometimes we had to force you. Some of these people I know, I had to, had that come to Jesus moment on a regular basis, it's this or we go to jail. It's this or you don't get your license back. Where do you wanna see yourself in six months? But without that program, we're seeing an increase in just rotating the door. Um, I also think I heard a lot of um, push on the jail. The jail has an, a, a captive audience. Now, being able to have a, somebody go in and do treatment, now this is not gonna be our body. This is the state. The state's responsible for making sure there's programs at the jail, similar to the ones in a lot of the jails throughout the state, um, be it um, getting treatment or even getting um, uh, an evaluation. And if that, you know, if I was gonna push for anything, I'd be calling, and not Dave's boss, <laughs> he's just the educator. <laughs> but I'd be talking to the big guns up, up at the state level on why, do, why don't we have um, people getting their, their treatment, the, their medications at the jail? Why are we not seeing them get an evaluation when they go in and they're there for months on end? Uh, on a personal note, my sister sat in that jail for six months she had a substance abuse issue. She went to jail because she fled. Now, she'll tell you to this day that, she, that that saved her life, but one thing didn't happen. She did not get a mental health evaluation. She came out of that jail with schizophrenia. And it took everything in our power and it's surprising that <laughs> something worse didn't happen. But the bottom line is, is people don't get what they need when they're in that jail, and maybe not in every jail. And that's, if people are going to jail, that should be where it starts. Are there four, I'm sorry, are there four hands to, uh, to a, look, you, your proposal's been kind of modified here, but do we all kind of understand what, what the, the basic, to at least move ahead with what possibly can be done um, by, by the city, not just the KPU marketing department, but the entire, the entire city to, uh, to promote some of these programs. And I actually kind of like your idea about putting those signs up over it uh, in that particular area, because I think, I think you're right, that's an area that will get noticed. But do we have four hands for, we'll explain it later. I'm not sure we need to start off with a marketing plan. I think we need to start off with just basic, simple. Th yes, oh, hold on. Well, I want to ch change. Yeah. Well, I was just, um, it would be my suggestion, and I'm just one person, that we start off with a couple of the similes we can do, and maybe if you want to have KPU talk to um, Ramonda about what, what a true marketing plan would involve, and the costs, and what they could afford, what we could afford, and... and does that make sense? Well, through this whole conversation, I think I went about it the wrong way, and I think I should reach out to Amanda, get her plan, and then bring it to the next city council meeting next week, and then we could have a 
clear idea of what they're wanting, and then I feel like we could direct city staff to give us information better that way than what we're going about right now. So I apologize. Does Sorry, anyone? Everyone. I mean, I'll do the work, and then I'll bring it to the next meeting. Okay. So. That works. Okay. Any other items to it? You know, we, we're starting to get late, so any other items to it to, to deal with tonight? I'm hoping not, because I think it's time to go. It's time to go to bed. Okay, we're going to close up the new business discussion item and uh, go to mayor and council comments. Ms. Zengi. Mr. Gass. Yeah, I think I jumped the gun earlier and thought I already gave him, so <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> Ms. Gage. I just did mine. <laughs> <laughs> that was noted. Mayor Severson. Thank you. Um, again, this is a community issue, and there's a lot of players out there that have a lot of resources. And I think that's the whole plan here, is to bring those back to bear in the best manner possible as we move forward. Because this isn't a, a short game. This is a long game. It's going to take a number of years to get ourselves to a point where we are have the impact that I think that we want in regards to opioid use in this community. Thank you. Ms. Bradbury. I've said enough. I'm good. Mr. Flora. Nothing, Your Honor. I just, I just have one um, um, thing I, w I wanted to note that, you know, we're, um, as council members, we often turn to staff and say, hey, can you organize something for us? And they do. And it just happens. It's a lovely thing. Um, after herding cats for the last two or three weeks, I really appreciate what you guys do for us when we say, hey, can you organize that for us? Because I, I, lo I love what happened here tonight, but boy, this was not easy to put together. And is, 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 there, is there a motion? I move to adjourn. <laughs> Want me to hit this thing? <laughs> <laughs>